literals jointly organized by bees and embassy of japan in bangladesh distinguished guests bangladesh has realized the importance of indo pacific and our honorable prime minister sheikh hasina has rightly pointed that out she said i quote any initiative in indo pacific should include creation of an environment of peace harmony stability of all countries focusing on entire aspect of sustainable development engaging countries based on mutual trust and mutual respect for mutual benefit focusing on wealth creation for all development must be inclusive and creating fair competition not rivalries i unquote that is why today's seminar is significant in terms of exchanging ideas and sharing the experience of beog bengal literals and other major stakeholders of the region regarding the issues of indo pacific ladies and gentlemen today we are very much pleased to have among us mr mohammad farooq khan mp chairman parliamentary standing committee on ministry of foreign affairs bangladesh parliament and his excellency ito nauki ambassador of japan to bangladesh our profound gratitude to all of you for attending this event the audience in today's program we have an inaugural session and a working session after this inaugural session there will be a break of 10 minutes for light refreshment then we shall reconvene here for the working session which will be followed by a humble lunch we hope to conclude our program by 13 20 hours ladies and gentlemen may i now request the chair of the session ambassador kaji imtiaz hussein to kindly commence the program please thank you assalam alaikum thank you very much uh, um first of all i would like to extend a, a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to first uh, event of of the year as as out by uh, uh i uh addressing our chief guest farooq khan parliamentary standing committee on ministry of foreign affairs parliament his excellency mr ito naoki ambassador of japan to bangladesh distinguished panelists ladies and gentlemen uh, and a very warm welcome to you all to today's hybrid seminar on the geopolitics of the indo-pacific and in connecting the bay of bengal literals i would like to thank honorable me for honoring my kind presence today i also warmly welcome his excellency mr ito naoki ambassador of japan the distinguished panelists and everyone present here today 2022 is a milestone year pan bilateral relations this year, diplomatic relations trees it is a time tested friendship which has grown in strength the first oecd country to recognize relations was established through the historical visit of the nation bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman in 1973 who believed that japan should be the role model for reconstruction and development for the war devastated bangladesh our two flags speak volumes of the symbiotic relations between our two countries and our peoples japan has emerged as one of our most important development partners as well as a very important trading partner the exchange of high level visits in recent years between our countries have added further impetus to our growing bilateral relations and mutual recognition of the tremendous potentials for further strengthening and deepening our ties the indo pacific which is the subject of our seminar today is witnessing renewed interest of the major power and has emerged as a region 
having immense geopolitical, economic, and strategic importance. With a population of around 4.3 billion across 24 nations, the region is promising in terms of its geographical location, natural and human resources. The two oceans also provide sea routes for the flow of most of the world's goods and energy supplies. Indeed, billions of dollars are being invested to build new ports, roads, pipelines, and railways to develop connectivity throughout the region. The need for infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific region is massive, totaling over $50 trillion US dollars by 2050. Given the fast emerging economic and strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific, it would indeed be useful exercise to understand the challenges, prospects, and potentials of the Indo-Pacific. This seminar jointly organized by the Embassy of, Bangladesh, uh, of Japan to Bangladesh and the Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, BIS, is a very timely one and is an endeavor to have a frank discussion on a shared vision of a free uh, discussion on the subject and to identify how best to leverage this potential based on a shared vision of a free, open, peaceful, secure and inclusive Indo-Pacific region for the peace, stability and shared prosperity for all. With these few words, may I call upon our Director General, Major General Mohammed Maksudur Rahman to de deliver his welcome address. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable Chief Guest, Muhammad Farooq Khan NP, Chairman, Parliamentary Standing Committee on Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Special Guest, His Excellency Aito Naiki, Ambassador of Japan to Bangladesh. Respected Chairman, Ambassador Kaji Imtia Hussain, Learned Panelist, Excellencies, Distinguished Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and very good morning to you all. On behalf of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, let me welcome you all to today's hybrid seminar on geopolitics of Indo-Pacific and reconnecting the Bay of Bengal littorals. Our heartfelt gratitude to the honorable chief guest and the special guest for addressing today's occasion. At the outset, I would like to pay the deepest tribute to the memory of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and to all the martyrs who laid their lives for the nation. While the entire nation is simultaneously celebrating the birth centenary of the father of the nation and golden jubilee of Bangladesh independence. Ladies and gentlemen, Asian region portrays a vivid tapestry of shared history in all its glory and civilization. Geographic position and deep cultural homogeneities have made the region as one of the most emerging and vibrant region in the world. However, being a region of deeply entrenched identity politics, intra and interstate conflict, great power, Rivalry, the geostrategic competition, Asian region continues to be one of the volatile region in the world. With the gradual shift of center of gravity of global power politics and the rise of China, the Asian region is becoming a hub of 21st century's economic opportunities and growing centrality to global geopolitical calculations. Particularly, Indo-Pacific region has gained centrality as a determiner of global peace and prosperity. Power politics in this region has tinted more geopolitical hotspots, engendered overlapping political and economic partnership and risks of conflict. China's Belt and Road Initiative also increased the geopolitical importance of the Indian Ocean and the state of Malacca as a sea line of communication. 
Recent great, great power competition in Indo-Pacific region has led to a geopolitical conundrum in the region, which has created a greater concern among the littorals of the Bay of Bengal and Indian region. Dear participants, being a key hotspot of connectivity, the Bay of Bengal bears great strategic importance. The Bay has been operating as a hub of strategic communion between the South and Southeast Asian countries for more than 2000 years. The intersection of these countries, as well as their strategic interest, has made the region a locus of competition between the countries of the region and beyond. Bangladesh, one of the key littoral, littorals of the Bay, is envisioning to be the developed country by 2041. Therefore, maritime resources are considered to be a major source of development and growth. After the peaceful resolution of maritime dispute with India and Myanmar, Bangladesh is focusing on maritime partnership and connectivity for its development interest for its development interest. Moreover, the geographic centrality of Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal is seen as the gateway to the South and Southeast Asian Asia, which allows it to play a hub role in regional and interregional trade and commercial activities. Distinguished guest, true friendship and mutual cooperation is at the heart of Bangladesh Japan bilateral relationships. Japan is one of the Bangladesh largest development partners. The Big B plan announced in September 2014 during Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's visit to Dhaka ushered a new era in Bangladesh Japan relationship. This scheme aims to make Bangladesh a center of the regional economy through enhancing connectivity and accelerating industrial growth between Bangladesh and its neighbor, particularly Nepal, Bhutan, and India's Northeastern region. Nevertheless, Bangladesh is also partnering BIMSTEC to enhance connectivity in the Bay of Bengal region and beyond. Bangladesh being a peace loving nation has become a pioneer of global peace and a role model for growth in South Asian region. In line with the famous dictum of its foreign policy, friendship to all, malice towards none, Bangladesh always welcomes partnership and promotes regional connectivity for its development interest, regional peace, and mutual prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, in this backdrop, Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies and the Japan jointly organized this hybrid seminar to understand the geopolitical realities of the Indo-Pacific region and how Japan and Bangladesh can work together to achieve the development goals for goals of the of both the countries and to work together to ensuring the peace and stability in this region. An academic exercise, I thank Japan and their collaboration with Institute of International and Studies for facilitating our research effort. I am really delighted to mention that Bangladesh and Japan are celebrating 50 years of their this rich new height. Finally, gratitude to the honorable chief guest, guest, distinguished panelist and us with your kind participation. I was expecting our respected Japanese will join us here in person. Situation, but they are connected with us virtually. I hope in the future they will visit Bangladesh, including Bangladesh Institute of International Studies. Thanks for your passion sharing.
Thank you, uh, welcome remarks. Uh, I'd like to invite our special guest, His Excellency, Mr. Naoki, Ambassador of Japan to, to deliver his statement. Excellent, have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Chief Guest, Muhammad Farouk Khan MP, Chairman, Parliamentary Standing Committee on Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Bangladesh Parliament, Ambassador Kazi Imtiaz Hossein, Chairman, Bangladesh of International and Strategic Studies, Peace, Major General Muhammad Maksudur, Director General, Biz, Professor Uzzaman Daka, Professor uh, Imuti Azamet, Professor Lailful Yasmin, University of Dhaka, Professor Kitomu, Aoyama Gakuen University, Japan, Professor Takahara Akio, University of Japan, uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Jeremy Butler, High Commissioner of Australia, uh, Excellencies, Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests, and Participants. Assalamu alaikum, shubo shokal, and good morning. It gives me great pleasure to be present at the hybrid seminar on geopolitics of Indo-Pacific and reconnecting the Bay of Bengal uh, literals, co-hosted by BIS and the Embassy of Japan. I am privileged to welcome distinguished scholars from Japan and Bangladesh to this seminar. I feel particularly honored to have Mr. Muhammad Farouk Khan MP as the chief guest. Thank you so much for your presence. Dynamism created by the confluence of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean is an engine of the economic growth of the entire world. The center of gravity of the world economy is shifting towards the Himalayas. The Bay of Bengal should seize the momentum and enjoy more economic prosperity. In this context, Bangladesh, located in the Bay of Bengal, is a vital country in geopolitical terms, as it is an intersection between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Bangladesh has shown its economic resilience despite the corona pandemic. Its GDP grew by almost 7% in the last fiscal year. Without a doubt, Bangladesh will be the fastest growing economy in Asia this decade, and its per capita income will soon reach 3,000 US dollars. Japan views the development of Bangladesh as significant, not only to Bangladesh itself, but also to the overall stability and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region. Still, Bangladesh needs to utilize its geographical advantage and increase its economic opportunities fully. In this regard, Japan has been developing Bangladesh's first deep sea port in Matabari, south of Chittagong. Matabari constitutes the Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt, so-called Big B. This initiative was agreed upon by the Honorable Prime Ministers of Japan and Bangladesh in 2014. The new port and the economic zone will become hubs of logistics, power and energy, and waterfront industry in Bangladesh and the region. Once completed, mother vessels can come directly to anchor at Matabari and will not need to reload containers at Colombo or Singapore. The deep sea port will connect Bangladesh to South Asia as a whole and Southeast Asia, and even to East Asia, including Japan. That will significantly enhance the economic opportunities of Bangladesh and open up the further possibility of regional development. In addition to the Matabari Deep Sea Port, 
JICA is implementing several large scale infrastructure projects under the Big B. For example, this year, Dhaka Mass Rapid Trans Transit MRT uh, Line 6, Dhaka Metro, will start its commercial operation in December. And Bangladesh Special Economic Zone in Arai Hajal will also be ready for international investment. This is the first economic zone developed by Japan. After that, Hazrat Shadal International Airport will show the new face of the nation within a few years when the JICA's Yen Loan projects completes. Those quality infrastructures will be a game changer to widen the domestic economic base and share the benefits of increasing cargo transportation and people's interchange. Above all, they will boost connectivity in the region, which has the strategic significance of enhancing economic opportunities in the Bay of Bengal. Matabari is the typical example of Japan's practical cooperation to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific, so-called FOIP, F-O-I-P, a vision to secure the region's peace, stability, and prosperity. Now let me elaborate on our vision of FOIP that Japan aims to pursue. A free and open Indo-Pacific will ensure a rule-based international order in order to bring peace, stability, and prosperity to every country in the region. In this regard, Bangladesh is a country that recognizes the importance of rule-based maritime order and shares its value with Japan and other like-minded countries. In the current situation in Ukraine, respecting the rule-based international order and adhering to international law are all the more important and critical. With Bangladesh, Japan promotes various practical cooperation, including anti-terrorism, disaster prevention, and maritime safety and security. Japan granted 24 rescue boats to the Bangladesh Coast Guard last December to support their operation in the high disaster risk areas. In addition, JICA started a training program on Coast Guard policy for Bangladesh Coast Guard officers. Currently, two officers are participating in the training program in Japan. Moreover, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force sent two ships for a port call to Chittagong last month. They conducted a goodwill exercise with the Bangladesh Navy to deepen their cooperation. In 2026, Bangladesh will graduate from the least developed countries LDC status and aims to become a developed in 2041 by achieving Vision 2041. Against the background of its rapid economic growth and political stability, the pivotal role as a center and under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hashina, and in this region, Bangladesh will play a more prominent role in promoting reconnecting the trials and addressing the global agenda. Bangladesh is provide and humanitarian assistance to displaced from Myanmar, a worthy lasting solution to a significant, not only to Bangladesh, but also to the entire region. This crisis is critical in embodying the vision of FOIP. The 1.1 million is to be the cause of instability. In that sense, we should work towards the enabling environment of their early repatriation, repatriation, as well as the improvement of education in Cox Bazaar to equip for the ultimate repatriation. 
I would like to mention that both the government's relocation policy of refugees to Bashanchal Island. Japan committed itself last month as the first to fund $2 million to UNHCR and WFP for their operation on Bashanchal. Bashanchal should be part of the long-term solution. Japan also would like to build an idea to enhance connectivity from Cox Bazar of Bangladesh to the Rakhine state of Myanmar. Envisioning the possible situation five years from now, ADB and BIMSTEC can play and lead the discussions to promote regional economic development and connectivity. Once realized, it will improve people's lives on both sides of the border. Rohingya is the largest refugee population in this region. Japan will do its utmost to resolve this issue together with the government of Bangladesh and the international community. In conclusion, I would like to mention that Japan and Bangladesh are time-tested friends. This year, as Mr. Director General mentioned, marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries, Japan and Bangladesh. So we should celebrate the milestone year in style. Earlier this month, we had an event together with foreign ministry. And to this congratulatory event of 50 years anniversary, Minister Kishido Fumio sent a message and emphasized that is an important part of realizing a free and open in the Pacific. Prime Minister also said that of the two symbolizes the special relationship that he used special. Minister also expressed his determination to work more closely with Prime Minister Sheikh Hashim people of Bangladesh to elevate our heights. Japan will continue its efforts to peace, stability, and prosperity in the region through realizing a FOIP in I hope today's seminar will serve as a compass for this effort. Thank you very much. Shobaike Onek Donabad. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Naoki, for your excellent uh, intervention. You have not only covered the, the existing uh, space between our two countries, uh, uh, which, which is a half a century old, but you also highlighted the potential that Bangladesh has and carries for itself, but for the region and, uh, and beyond. Uh, thank you very much for. for uh, May I now uh, request and an uh, to to invite our chief guest Khan MP, a chairman parliamentary standing committee on Ministry of to kindly deliver. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Ambassador Kazi, Imtia Hussain Chairman, Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies. General Mohammad Maksudur Rahman, Director General of BIASS. His Excellency Itanawaki, our very good friend and Ambassador of Japan to Bangladesh. Excellencies, distinguished participants from home and abroad, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I, but I think I should, cannot stop there. I can see so many of my very good friends, well-wishers here. So to all of you, assalamu alaikum, shubha shakal, and a very good morning. It's a great pleasure to attend today's hybrid seminar on the geopolitics of Indo-Pacific and reconnecting the Bay of Bengal literals which is an important and timely topic. At the outset, in this auspicious month of February, I want to put to all the martyrs who gave their lives in 1952 
to protect our right to our mother tongue. My deepest homage to the champion of our language movement, the greatest Bengali of all times, father of our nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. I extend my appreciation to Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, BIASS, and the Embassy of Japan in Dhaka for hosting this seminar. I trust the exchange of ideas in today's seminar will help to generate better understanding of the current strategic scenario and future areas of cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. I hope this seminar will shed, shed light as to how laterals of the Bay of Bengal region can play a vital role in shaping the common and shared vision of the Indo-Pacific region. Ladies and gentlemen, the concept of Indo-Pacific has rapidly been emerging as both a region and an idea. As a region, the Indo-Pacific, which connects the Indian and Pacific oceans, serves as the world economic and geopolitical center. With rapid development due to the region, this region's vitality, economic growth, and more importantly, the growing strategic importance makes the region as an epicenter of tension between major powers. As a geostrategic idea, the Indo-Pacific has gained credit in the international area. The term Indo-Pacific received much currency once the Japanese former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe described it in 2007 as the confluence of two seas. Since then, both as a region and as a strategic idea, Indo-Pacific is gaining prominence among the great powers and the small nations alike. The, sh the shift of the center of gravity towards Asia has been confirmed by the evolving geopolitical order of, the re of this region. The rise of China and India as major powers, as well as Japan's rise as an economic powerhouse has ensured the geostrategic gravitation towards Asia. The region also elevates maritime thinking in the strategic discourse. Thus, this region is going to play an important role in the geostrategic competition of the rising powers over maritime domain as well. My learned audience, being located in the center of the Indo-Pacific region, the Bay of Bengal holds economic and strategic importance. Given the emerging geopolitical context of the Indo-Pacific, the littoral region, the Bay of Bengal is witnessing increasing strategic attention due to major powers growing interest in the area from economic, maritime, and energy perspectives. The growing strategic interest of the major powers for, for best utilization that the, Bay of, that the Bay offers and the increasing of the rising, rising powers related are gradually turning the Bay of Bengal region into a hub of converging and conflicting. This backdrop, Bay of Bengal literals, the major powers will be the center of attention in the tackle the uncertainty, the expectation that middle powers, middle power countries like Japan can play more active role in ensuring this region. The of the concept of free and open Indo Pacific. Japan has the with like my to oppose it is flexible through As one of Bangladesh peaceful and Myanmar to explore 
Doing so, we need a peaceful Bay of Bengal as well as a peaceful Indo-Pacific region. In the current reality, state will dominate any region. And I strongly believe that, like Bangladesh, other littorals of the Bay of Bengal want to cooperate then to antagonize each other. Therefore, practicing multilateral framework becomes a need for allowing each country to pursue its aim on equal footing. For this to happen, it is necessary in the case of Bay of Bengal that the littorals need to give more credibility to multilateral arrangements. Supporting this principle, we have confirmed our position that Bangladesh does not want dominance of any single country or group in the Indo-Pacific. Besides to establish sustainable regional prosperity across the Indo-Pacific, we need to stop any kind of conflict. You all know that Bangladesh is the worst sufferer of the Rohingya crisis. Thus, for establishing a free, open, and secure Indo-Pacific, Japan can utilize the opportunity of being an active player in finding a lasting solution to this crisis. As resolving the Rohingya crisis, is a, is a pressing need and a very relevant to the future stability of the Indo-Pacific region. Our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, also sought support from Japan's current Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, to involve, to evolve actively in getting up the sustainable repetition of the displaced Rohingyas. With resolving conflicts and promoting multilateral engagements, literals of the Bay of Bengal, as well as the countries across the Indo-Pacific can enjoy sustainable prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, with the dream of building the Shunar Bangla, Golden Bengal of the dream of our father of the nation, Mangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Bangladesh will continue to support peace and inclusive development despite all difficulties. With this understanding, I also look forward to receiving valuable insights from today's seminar on how we as literals of the Bay of Bengal can play a role in making a peaceful Bay as well as a non-violent Indo-Pacific region for nurturing inclusive development. Having said these words, I wish you all a successful deliberation and discussions. I thank you. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabundu, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you, sir, uh, for your insightful address. Uh, you have not only highlighted the, uh, the importance of, of the uh, literal countries engaging in a multilateral uh, way, but you've also uh, highlighted the, the uh, need for resolving uh, differences, revol particularly with, uh, in the context of the Rohingya crisis that we have been facing for the past four years, and, and how important it would be for the uh, region's stability as well as uh, beyond it. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are indeed passing through a very significant time in the Indo-Pacific. Our distinguished speakers have highlighted opportunities and potentials that the Indo-Pacific region hold and underscored the need to build partnership for mutual benefits of the countries in the region and beyond. The strategic initiatives such as Asia Rebalancing Strategy, Belt and Road Initiatives, Free and Open Indo-Pacific Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, and the crucial geopolitical centrality of the Bay of Bengal has placed the Bay at the pivot of the Indo-Pacific. Despite the enormous opportunities for economic prosperity, the geopolitical and strategic realities will be key factors dictating the course of developing a shared vision for peace, prosperity, and stability. There is a need for concerted efforts to have transparent discussions and deal with this any misgivings or misperception that there may be on the geopolitical and geostrategic competition 
and to materialize the full potentials of the Indo-Pacific for the greater benefit of the countries and the peoples for served by these two oceans through collaborative and cooperative actions, the multilateral aspect that was highlighted by the Honorable Minister. Bangladesh has always adhered to the dictum friendship towards to all and malice towards none, as enunciated by the father of the nation, Bangamundu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Bangladesh believes peace remains an imperative for economic development, prosperity, and stability. Under the visionary leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh has been intensely pursuing regional integration, an aspect that was highlighted by, the, uh, by His Excellency Ambassador Naoki. Multi-regional and sub-regional organizations such as SAR, IORA, BIMSTEC, BCIM, and BBIN can become platforms for, region, for the region to tap on the connectivity initiatives, to reap the benefit of regional and sub-regional integration. Let me end here with a quote from a speech by our Honorable Foreign Minister, Dr. A.K. Abdul Momen, at a plenary session of the Asia Pacific in the changing global order. And, and I would quote, Bangladesh is open to any global and regional initiative, which is economic in nature and helps economic development. An aspect that was also uh, uh, very eloquently highlighted by our honorable uh, uh, chairman of the standing committee. Uh, I would uh, like to end uh, our inaugural session here, but I would like to, uh, uh, before doing that, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our uh, former uh, foreign secretary and our high commissioner uh, to India, uh, Ambassador Tariq Karim and Ambassador Shamshan Mobin. And, and many other distinguished members. I have also see our former chairman of PIS and Ambassador uh, Nassim Fiddos, uh, uh, Madam, and, and I'm, I thank you all. But uh, I would like to uh, particularly uh, acknowledge uh, the participation of four distinguished speakers that we will be having here. Um, uh, Professor Kikuchi Sutomu and Professor Takahara Akyu from Japan who, would be, uh, who have joined us uh, virtually and Professor Imtiaz Ahmed and Professor Lilufar Yasmin are participating in person. A very warm welcome to you. The uh, next session, the working session, would be moderated by uh, Professor Rashid Zaman of the Department of International Relations. With those words, uh, may I uh, declare this inaugural session uh, end and, and invite you to have a warm cup of coffee and tea. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, may I kindly request you to join us for light refreshment. It is arranged at the lobby and garage area. Our BIS faculty will guide you to the designated locations. I remind you, the working session will start in 10 minutes, which is at 11.28. Thank you. Tomo and Professor Takahara Akio. Professor, can you, can, uh, can you unmute and uh, say something so that we know that you can... We hear you. Okay, now I can unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Professor. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Nice. Professor, can you be a bit louder? <laughs> Sir, can you unmute? Okay, thank you. Just now, yeah. I muted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
So. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I welcome you all to today's working session. The session will be moderated by Professor Rashidu Zaman, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. It will commence with the presentation on the changing nature of geopolitics, making sense of Bangladesh's position by Professor Imtiaz Ahmed, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. This will be followed by a presentation on beyond US-China relations, Japan's strategic vision for the Indo-Pacific by Professor Kikuchi Sutomo, International Political Economy, Ayugiyama Gakuin University, Japan. Thereafter, Professor Lailufar Yasmin, Department of International Relations, will give a presentation on the rise of Indo-Pacific Bangladesh-Japan relations. Finally, Professor Takahara Akio, Graduate School of Public Policy, the University of Tokyo, Japan, will deliver his presentation on free and open Indo-Pacific and maritime cooperation, Japan's initiative. Then the floor will be open for discussion. Thereafter, the moderator will make the concluding remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now request the moderator of the session, Professor Rashidu Zaman, to kindly take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the working session of the hybrid seminar on geopolitics of India Pacific and the reconnecting uh, the Bay of Bengal literals. Uh, since we have uh, are waiting at the other end of the of the line, um, I will um, start the program. Uh, let me just uh, say a few words about the first presenter. Most of you know him very well, but still, I think um, I should say a few words about him. Uh, Professor is a is a professor of international relations and director of center for genocide studies at the university of dhaka he's also currently visiting professor at sagese university beirut he has authored co-authored or edited 30 monographs 20 research papers having been having been published in lead in edited volumes. Uh, Professor Dr. Imtiaz will speak on uh, the changing nature of geopolitics, making sense of Bangladesh's position, and he has 15 minutes um, to tell us about this very interesting topic. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair uh, uh, the Chief Guest, Honorable Mr. Farooq Khan, Member of Parliament. There are too many imtiazes in this room today, I, see, can, I can see that. Uh, excellencies, dignitaries, my friends, and I understand I also have some students uh, at the back. Uh, let me uh, start very quickly. Uh, when I saw it's 15 minutes, Normally, I'm a powerless, pointless person, but I thought, let me use some PowerPoint so that things can flow easily. Uh, okay, let's start with the first uh, slide, please. The first thing that we have to get into our mind is humans create, geopolitics does not create humans. This is the central argument in, throughout my paper. And for that reason, 
keep in mind that areas, countries can become geopolitically important, but at the same time can also become geopolitically unimportant if the humans have made a difference. Now, let's go for the next, next slide. Nazim Hikmat, the Turkish poet, you know, if we can remember him a little bit, particularly his, uh, this particular verse, then it will help us understand why humans create geopolitics. Said, brother, just wait, as long as I've got honey in my pot, bees will come to eat from Timbuktu. So the reason why an area becomes geopolitically important is because you have the honey. If the honey is not there, then the bees will not come. And that's the important part of the argument that I will make. Next slide, please. Now, go back to the 18th century. When you, when you had the Greater Bengal, don't forget the British entered through the Bengal. Now in 18th century, the largest economy in the world was China. So what we have today in China is re-rise of China, not rise of China. Similarly, what we have in South Asia, whether it's India or Bangladesh is not rise of India or rise of Bangladesh, re-rise of India. The reason in 18th century, China was the largest economy, but undivided India was the second largest economy in the world. And in that undivided India, Bengal was the richest province. And that's precisely the reason why all the way the Europeans came to Bengal. Not for, you don't go to a poverty area, you know, uh, you don't uh, you know, spend your time uh, and your life to go to some poverty ridden area, you go to a rich area. Next slide, please. Now the arrival of the British actually marked the birth of international relations in South Asia. And we have a precise date for that is 1757 when they conquered Bengal. Uh, this painting shows a little bit the richness and the arrival of uh, the British and the, and the Europeans. But then, the British and the Europeans had other ideas in their mind. Next slide, please. And that brings to colonialism and the underdevelopment of Bengal, particularly the deindustrialization of the Dhaka city. The city that you are in was one of the largest cities in 18th century. And it had a flourishing what industry, and there are statistics at how it got depopulated during British colonial time. So you literally ended up with the industrialization of Bengal and the industrialization of England. Next slide, please. But then Europe became Europe of today out of this two particular confluence called colonialism and slavery. So without colonialism and slavery, you don't have the rise of the West. And the triangle is a very interesting one where you can see where you can see the slaves were brought from Africa and they worked in America and the raw materials then went to Europe. Now this is really interesting, you know, if you talk about Dundee and some other, you know, Manchester, they don't produce cotton, but they became the leading cotton producer of the world. And that's because they got all the cotton from somewhere else. But in that process, Bengal literally got into a serious trouble to the point that you have the richest province in the 18th century end up with the famine of 1943. Next slide, please. Yes, this will tell you that the richest province then ended up uh, with famine of 1943 to the point you have Churchill and we celebrate Churchill a lot uh, where he said, I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. Uh, the Churchill's man-made famine actually killed 3.5 3 to, 3 to 5 million people in Bengal alone. Next slide, please. Now, that was one part of Bengal, but, but Bengal or Bangladesh that today also got categorically massacred at the hands of the British. When we say Bengal, it actually meant Bengal means Greater Bengal, Bihar, Orissa, and Bengal. 
uh, and anybody, you know, if you have uh, heard of Nawab Sirajudullah, you'd, you'd know that it always used to be Bangla, Bihar, and Orissa. That's what Bengal is all about, and that's precisely why you have Bay of Bengal as, 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 as the name. But then Bengal got categorically massacred. First, the, they threw out Assam, and then they threw out Bihar and Orissa. Uh, but uh, even with that, uh, they were not satisfied uh, on religious ground. Bengal was divided into East and West Bengal. Interestingly, when the 1905 Beng uh, Bengal partition took place, and when it was revoked in 1911, Bengal was united, but Bihar and Orissa were thrown out, and nobody took the trouble of uh, you know, working on, on that, why that was so. Next slide, please. Yeah, this slide will tell you, this is a statement by Mr. Risley, who was the Home Secretary, uh, who writes to Lord Curzon, who was the Viceroy in 1904, that was just before the partition of Bengal, he says, Bengal united, and I'm quoting him, Bengal united is a power, Bengal divided will pull in several different ways. One of our main objects is to split up and thereby weaken a solid body of opponents to our rule. Uh, so it was a deliberate policy, this cartographical massacre. Next slide, please. Out of the cartographical massacre came the partition of Bengal in 1947. And of course, uh, you have now what Bangladesh is all about. It's, it's absolutely a cartographical massacre, East Bengal, then becoming East Pakistan. Uh, but then the process was not that easily, uh, it was not that easy. Next slide, please. Over a million people died in 1947. And the trauma continues even today in, from house to house. And if you're into psychology, you'd know that fear gets transferred from you know, it's a heritage, it goes from family to family. So it becomes generational. Uh, and I'm talking of uh, Gustav Wung, in fact, Carl Gustav Wung, experimental psychologist made it very clear that the brain of a child is not really pure. It carries the fear and the love of parents and grand grandparents and goes on and on. So the fear uh, of 1947 continues today. But this was the first genocidal. Next slide, please. Then in 71, you have again another genocide. Look at the traumatic, traumatized people of Bangladesh. Is, is, you know, sometimes I say, my God, just to stand up. We had one poet, he passed away. Shamsur Rahman had a fantastic line. He said, and let me say in Bangla first, Akono Dariyachi Yamar Ak Dharunir Ahunkar. That I'm standing, that is my pride. And I can see why poet had this civilizational understanding that my standing. Is, is very tough. Look at the Putin in a big, the whole history is really traumatizing. And one can go back to sixth century BC when we talk of Bengal. So some of, sometimes when we talk of civilization, we need to keep in mind that it is not 1971. You can go back to sixth century BC. Now out of all these traumas, civilizational, you know, all these ups and downs, next slide will tell you interesting things. Three exceptionality came out when we talk about Bangladesh, three South Asian exceptions. Only Bangladesh has it. And I'm one, when I talk about Bangladesh, the current Bangladesh, which is 55,126 square miles. The first exceptionality is Bangladesh is the only South Asian country which calls itself People's Republic. None of the other countries are People's Republic. There are only five People's Republic in the world today, there were some more, but only five. The oldest one is North Korea, then China. The third is Algeria, fourth is Bangladesh, and fifth is Laos. These are the five People's Republic. And there were good reasons for Bangabandhu to call People's Republic. He did not even, you know, never had a second thought as to what would be the name of the country. And it's, it's in, in his handwriting, actually. People's Republic. He never thought about whether democratic republic or whether it should be just republic. You know, never had that. It's People's Republic because he he knew. And this is the second exceptionality. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, South Asia. So in South Asia, Bangladesh is the only country which literally fought a liberation war where you had people and the security forces together. 
I was just a class nine student, but I left my parents. I went to Agotola, little slip on the pavement, but we were led by an EPR Jawan, not even an officer, simple EPR Jawan, and we obeyed him 200%, whatever he said. That combination you don't get in any other South Asia. One can talk about INA and Subhash Bosch, but Subhash Bosch did not carry through, as you know, history went in different direction. And the third exceptionality, which is very important and very pertinent to our discussion. Next slide, please. Out of that, or almost out of that, is the South Asia ex exceptionality of the foreign policy principle. Keep in mind this friendship towards all, malice towards none, is not post-1971 principle. This principle was established in the Awamili Manifesto in June 1970 as an election manifesto. And it was clearly stated, friendship towards malice towards none, if, and this is Pakistan we are talking about, that if we come to power, the friendship, uh, the foreign policy principle of Pakistan will be friendship towards all malice to none. Keep in mind, uh, uh, the, keep the context in, in your head, Pakistan was then member of CENTO and Seattle. Still, Awami League, under the leadership of Bangabundu, had the guts to say that we will not be part of CENTO and Seattle if we come to power. And you can easily see why the United States was not happy, and we have a different ups and down history with the United States all through. Uh, next slide. Now, in the global context, what we had is decolonization coming in the 40s and the 50s, of course, in a big way in the 60s. And from that decolonization, you have globalization. And from that globalization, you have rise of the Asian economies. Of course, Japan was very early on. And now we talk about re-rise of China. We talk re-rise of India. And we talk today, we also heard a little bit of re-rise of Bangladesh. Next slide, please. 50 years of experience, 50 years of independence. Look at the key numbers, and then you can see what difference that Bangladesh made in 50 years. Back in 71, GDP was 8 billion, now 320. Per capita income, $93 only. And today we heard that uh, it can reach 3,000 very soon. Uh, Go into all the life expectancy, 47 years, 70, no, 73 years, uh, go any category you use. In 50 years, Bangladesh has made a difference. Next slide, please. If you, like, if you look into per capita income and uh, you know, human, uh, human development index, so it's not only GDP. You know, people would say, oh, you know, GDP is not the right way of looking into it. You know, all those are fine, which is, I have no arguments on that. But look, look at the Human Development Index, and, and you will see that we have really done well, even compared, of course, compared to the country from which we came out, Pakistan. But we also are doing a little bit better in many of the human development categories, uh, you know, when it comes to India. And if you look at uh, life expectancy, uh, we have almost where China is, you know, 72.5. China is 76.3. We have already crossed India and Pakistan when it comes to life expectancy. Next uh, slide. Uh, if you look at the development mom momentum pre-pandemic and post and, and pandemic, uh, Bangladesh has done pretty pretty well, relatively well. You know, with all you know negatives uh, in, uh, during the pandemic, and today we heard that it almost reached seven percent. You can talk about the numbers and statistics in a way, but one can see that Bangladesh has somehow managed uh, for, for it could, different reasons, and we can discuss that it, uh, uh, the pandemic that we had somehow Bangladesh got through at least up until now as we speak. Next slide, very quickly, geopolitical competitions. Here we have an interesting equation. Yes, uh, the rise of China, uh, has made people worried. And we see in the Pacific Alliance, we have Quad and also the Build Better uh, World Partnership also almost, uh, it seems that uh, is directed towards uh, BRI. Uh, but then in recent, uh, in two weeks, we also have this Russia, <laughs> some linkages with China. And, and, and I don't know where it will go, I have no idea, but uh, one has to look into it, whether we are going to see uh, a different kind of realignment between Russia and, and China.
but this is the geopolitical competitions that we're having. How did, uh, how well they did uh, during the pandemic? Next slide, please. Somehow COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, the, the cooperation was not that strong and those limits uh, of cooperation and, and you can easily see the vaccine nationalism made a difference in Europe. Uh, one can easily see Europe is also not together uh, and we can talk about Ukraine maybe later and of course uh, Brexit and all things. And, but even with the Quad, I think uh, both uh, India and Japan have different uh, understanding at least uh, they thought uh, Quad would be of different kind. Uh, let's look into, next slide please, the difference between BRI and uh, Build Better uh, Partnership. Uh, you know, they don't really clash actually. And I was looking into, you know, in, uh, the text and, and looking into some of the categories. Uh, BRI is more traditional infrastructure, whereas the other one is non-traditional, you know, uh, it's port, highways and airports when it comes to BRI, but with build better partnership with the United States is more climate health, digital technology and gender equity and, and equality. The last one, it would be problematic for a lot of Asian countries because it has some linkage with civil society and that a lot of Asian countries are, are not, uh, not really into it because they have a different uh, understanding of it. Next slide, please. But more important is the geopolitics of the military industrial complex. You know, don't underestimate the power of military industrial complex. Last two minutes. Uh, the military industrial complex, uh, given the fact, you know, President Eisenhower, who was an army person, in his farewell speech, uh, made it very clear to the United States that, look, you have to be very careful of this military industrial complex. And this seems to be the case even today. Uh, and I guess uh, why uh, India and Japan are uncomfortable, because probably the United States' understanding of reproducing the military complex through power. And that is my argument would be the transformation from Kuwait to Triad, uh, as you can see, uh, and US, uh, and not of of uh, of uh, Kuwait. Okay, last slide is why will Bangladesh be? And this has already been planned. We have a development without enmity. Bangladesh literally does not have any enemies, literally. Myanmar is trying very hard to make us enemy, but we are not interested uh, in making Myanmar an enemy. We trade with them. We even visit with them. We have collaboration with them. So we are not interested in making Myanmar an enemy. And moreover, Rohingya is not a Bangladesh military, uh, sorry, Bangladesh Myanmar problem. Rohingya problem is not a Bangladesh Myanmar problem. Rohingya problem is Myanmar and the people of Myanmar problem, and that's Rohingya. This has to be made it very, very clear. So when it comes to development with inventive, believe it or not, we are in everything. SAR, BBI, BCM, name anything, you know, build better, you know, uh, we are ready so long. It is a security, uh, it is a economic security issue and not a military security issue. So when it comes to economics, when it comes to political, when it comes to economic development, we are all for it, but not for any military alliance or anything that will have that you, you know, your enemy is your enemy. We don't want to make your friends are your friends. We don't want to make your enemy also my enemy. That, you know, that's, that's not what Bangladesh is. And I will, you know, I'll just emphasize the point that this has always been civilizationally as a Bengali. They have always invited people. We suffered for that. We suffered many times because we they overstayed and they, they literally exploited uh, our resources. But even today, you will see every Bengali, if you meet, they will invite you. And, and that's, that has been, uh, you know, has always been part of our history and part of our civilization. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Intia Ahmed, for um, walking us through the importance of geopolitics um, of Bengal uh, as seen through the historical uh, prism. Um, 1905 partition was mentioned, maybe towards the end of the session, I may some say something about the 1905 partition. Uh, but right now, um, uh, we will uh, move across uh, the oceans and, of course, um, uh, we will go all the way to Japan, where we have our next uh, speaker waiting, and, and we look forward to hearing from him. Uh, just let me say a brief words about uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Kikuchi uh, Sutomo. Uh, he's a professor and, uh, and former vice president, Ioma Gaokin University, Tokyo, Japan. He has been working as an adjunct senior fellow of the Japan Institute of International Affairs for many years. He is currently the chair of uh, the Institute's study group on Japan's Indo-Pacific strategy. He has been engaged in various track two activities and international research projects conducted under such regional institutions as the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council, PECC, and Council for Security Cooperation in Asia, in Asia Pacific, uh, CSCAP. Uh, uh, Professor Kikuchi will uh, speak on beyond US-China relation, Japan's strategic vision for the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, I, I invite Professor um, Kikuchi to, uh, to connect and to uh, speak to us on this very important issue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zaman. I share my file uh, with you. Professor, you have to unmute yourself. Here's yeah, can you see uh, the file? Okay. Uh, Professor uh, Zaman, thank uh, you very much. You can for use your... earphone if you like. Oh, pardon? Can you hear? And also, can you see uh, my Professor, file? I can't hear you yet. Oh, can you see my file? Can we contact him in any way? Oh, just a moment. Now we can hear. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I, I will, okay. Can you see my file? Yes, we can see your files. Okay. So first of all, uh, I, I express my thanks to uh, uh, two organizers, uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, Institute of International and Strategic Studies, and also Japanese Embassy in, in, in Dhaka. It's my uh, great pleasure to be given this uh, opportunity to, to speak in, in, in at this uh, seminars. So my uh, title of my presentations are Beyond US China Relation, Japan Strategic Visions for the Indo Pacific. Of course, this is this is based on my uh, interpretation or understanding of what Japanese government have been doing so far. So today's uh, outline of my presentation first, I would explain uh, some background of Japan FOIP uh, visions, then move to uh, three pillars to realize the visions. This is my based on my interpretation of Japan's engagement in the Indo-Pacific. Then uh, thirdly, I moved to a uh, uh, future, you know, a shape of international order in the Indo-Pacific toward more multipolar Indo-Pacific regional orders. Then uh, finally, I would briefly touch upon the importance of Bangladesh to Japan's Indo-Pacific uh, visions. So firstly, background, as Ambassador Ito already mentioned, Japan uh, have been pursuing so-called FOIP, free and, and open in the Pacific strategies. Professor, and I'm sorry, we, uh, to, interrupt. Professor, I'm uh, sorry can, to interrupt, but can you please enlarge your slide? Oh, no, no, this is the largest one. Oh, you cannot read this one? No, we can see, but it would be better if you can enlarge the slide. Oh, just a moment. 
I think this is a dodge stop. All right, all right, professor. Then it's fine. Okay. okay. I think you can make it full screen on the presentation mode. Oh, just a moment. Full screen. Speaker. Hmm? So I think we can continue. So it's it's fine. Okay, thank I you. Sorry. And as I mentioned, you know, the ambassador Ito already mentioned uh, the Japan FOIP uh, ideas, and this is you know based on Japan's long time you know experience in the foreign relations. So Japan, we uh, we have uh, convictions that the rule based orders have been providing. Are uh, excellent opportunity for Japan to get peace and prosperity for the last uh, several decades. So under the FOIP uh, umbrella, Japan has been enhancing the rule-based regional order in the in the Pacific. But to our regret, this regional order is now in flux. So we Japan have a deep sense of uncertainty about the future of regional orders. We have uh, many challenges for sustaining rule-based orders. One is China's unilateral assertive and coercive behavior. But also, we have a growing concern about US willingness to sustain the rule-based regional orders, as well as regional securities. And also, we are seeing rising tension between the US and China. And we have a growing concern that Indo-Pacific regional order in the future will be determined only by US-China relations whether in confrontation or in cooperation. But at the same time, we have now new opportunities. So we have many stakeholders committed to the rule-based orders. So many countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia now imagine a strong promoter for you know, rule-based regional orders. Not just you know, big powers like India, but also small and medium-sized country in these regions or more embracing open and rule-based orders. So those countries in Indo-Pacific are seeking more independence, autonomies, not just power in the power politics among major powers. So they have agency to navigate in a great competition between big powers. So in my understanding, those countries have substantial impact on the future shape of regional orders in the Indo-Pacific in the coming decades. And to promote the four visions, Japan has been pursuing the variety of policy measures. And I categorize three pillars to realize the visions. First, keep US engaged in the regions. Second, Japan has been moving southward to construct a new network of new alignment bilaterally, trilaterally, and also quadrilaterally with the countries and the institutions in the in the Pacific. The third pier would be a constructive engagement with China. So I'll explain 
uh, each peers. First, keep US engaged in the regions. So stable regional orders requires structure of forces, balance of powers, the, to support stable regional orders. So in this regard, United States is indispensable players in the foreseeable future. So it is essential that United States will remain involved in the regional affairs and contribute to maintaining the balance of power in the regions. So US in the Pacific countries, including Japan and Bangladesh, we have agencies to shape regional orders, but US presence give us agencies because there are no powers, there is no agency for small and medium-sized countries. And the US-Japan alliance uh, is a key component of rule-based orders. The, actually, the, our alliance with the United States is one of the key instruments to keep U.S. engaged in the regions. Second, Japan has been moving southward. So Japan has been actively engaged the, 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 the countries in, in the south, including India, Australia, ASEAN countries and literal states in South Asia and South Pacific Island nations. And we have been developing a variety of bilateral new arrangement and also minilateral arrangement. Japan, Australia, Japan, ASEAN, and we have been doing a lot in our relation with the countries in uh, South Asia, including India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Also, we have been developing trilateral uh, mechanisms such as Japan, India, Australia, Japan, India, uh, US, and so forth. Also, as previous speaker pointed out, we have been developing quadrilateral security dialogue between Japan, India, US and Australia. So Quad is quite a promising regional unilateral arrangement to keep US engaged in the regions and also contribute to promote public goods in the in the Pacific in the coming decades. And also Quad will serve a mechanism to, to put some institutional constraint on against US unilateral and sometimes too aggressive behaviors. And more networked structures is emerging within Indo-Pacific uh, regions. So actually you have been seeing the increasing number of overlapping plurilateral grouping uh, in this regions. Also, Japan has been actively engaged in creating region-wide economic uh, uh, arrangement such as uh, P, uh, TPP-11 progress and uh, 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 TPP-11 and also East Asia-based uh, regional economic arrangement such as RCEP and so forth. And also, China is a quite important partner for Japan. So pressing, so constructive engagement with China, the one of the pillar for Japan's Indo-Pacific uh, visions. So pressing task is to create a regional architecture under which China respect for international rules and plays constructive role for regional peace and prosperities. The Japan's engagement with China, which is essential for regional peace and stability, have to be 
underlined by enhanced Japan's regional positions. So Japan has been expanding the area of cooperation and also managing tension in our relation with China. So if I uh, simply put, the we stand up to China when China take a deviant behavior against international rules. But at the same time, we are getting along with China. And how we you know, see the future regional orders. The, we share the most of the concerns that the United States has of China. But Japan does not want to be fully entangled into US-China relations, either Cold War type of con confrontation or rapprochement with you know, G2 between two countries. So we look for more space for maneuvering and more autonomies in this uh, you know, emerging new regional environment. So we need, Japan need a regional architecture not defined only by US-China relations. So we must go beyond US-China relations. And in the Pacific, is more than US and China. So in the Pacific is not just the battleground by two superpowers playground. In the Pacific is a playground for other countries to play constructive role to enhance the rule-based regional orders. So we are not found the mercy of power politics between the US and China, but capable to navigate the great game of uh, the future of Indo-Pacific. So I think, you know, now is the moment to step away from long standing and old fashioned assumption that only big powers can define the regional orders. So current uh, flux of regional orders may give an opportunity for us to create more multipolar rule-based uh, orders. So Bangladesh, which is located in a strategic trade routes, uh, route, uh, route of the Indo-Pacific is very important country for realization of Japan's Indo-Pacific uh, visions. And I would uh, briefly mention the, the possibility, potential of Bay of Bengal uh, economic uh, zones. Actually, we, not only Japan, but also almost all Indo Pacific countries, we need a new market for investment and trade. And we are feeling that we are too much exposed to uncertain China economically. So we need to diversify our economic relations more. So there is an urgent need to review our regional supply chain right now. So COVID-19 clearly demonstrate how fragile the our supply chain are. So we need to engage in the orienting the regional center of economic gravity away from China by pursuing new interdependence with other potentially promising regions. And I think new economic opportunities now emerging in the Bay of Bengal. In the past, our economies of South Asia and Southeast Asia 
uh, deeply intervene around the Bay of Bengal. The possibility of linking economic dynamism of South Asia and Southeast Asia in the Bay of Bengal around, around the Bay of Bengal is now emerging. Actually, our countries in this region have been demonstrating remarkable economic growth recently and, and taking more outward looking uh, economic uh, policies. So they have plenty of economic potential being center of economic gravities from abandoned young labor to natural resources. Of course, there are many obstacles, shortcomings, difficulties, but those can be overcome based on the, um, the experience in the Asia Pacific. So experiment of building economically integrated Asia Pacific began 1980s, nearly 40 years ago. Overall, this project has been successful. The countries of Asia Pacific are closely connected through dense cross-border network of investment and trade. So I myself have been involved in the creating the mechanism to promote Asia Pacific economic interdependence since late 1980s. And at the beginning of the project in 1980s, there were overwhelming amount of skeptics about the possibility of this experiment. experiment. So, so many problems to promote economic cooperation in Indo-Pacific, such as diversity, fragmentation, mutual distrust, lack of habits of uh, cooperation and so forth. So when I involved in uh, Asia Pacific economic cooperation project, most people did not believe the Asia Pacific economies to be connected closely through trade and investment. But you know, a few decades later, we are now witnessing tense uh, network of economic uh, uh, relation among Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, Asia-Pacific countries. So I think uh, this is a quite long-term project, but you know, we can, you know, in the coming decades, uh, we can see a more dynamic, economically dynamic, dynamic economically integrated. Uh, Bay of Bengal uh, economic uh, regions. Thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you for your uh, listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor um, Stomo, uh, for presenting a very interesting um, uh, perspective on, on, on what is happening in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, most of the time, we usually uh, look at this entire uh, phenomena from either a Western perspective or uh, from a Chinese perspective. It's very interesting that you have raised uh, the Japanese uh, uh, vision on, on this particular region. And I'm sure that it has raised a lot of questions um, in the minds of our uh, audience who are connected both here and of course um, online. And, and of course, uh, uh, they, will, they will come up with their questions during the Q&A session. Uh, right now we have another uh, speaker uh, from Bangladesh, um, Professor Dr. Lailufar Yasmin. Um, let me just briefly introduce her. Professor uh, Lailufar Yasmin teaches at the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. She has been a recipient of the US Fulbright, the British Chevening, and the Australian International Postgraduate Research Scholarship, IPRS. She has done her fellowships uh, at the University of Ulster, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, the Ford Foundation Fellowship um, at um, APCSS, Hawaii, and of course, uh, the Fellowship on Women and Conflict uh, 1325 um, under the Scottish Government Initiative. Uh, Professor Dr. Lalifar Yasmin will speak on the rise of the Indo-Pacific, Bangladesh-Japan relations. And uh, may I request her to 
to ensure that she finishes within 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this generous introduction, which is actually compiled by me. So obviously the stories of uh, failure are not uh, written there. So I'll try my best to do a justice to that. Um, His Excellencies um, and uh, um, dignitaries, um, honorable uh, uh, member of parliament. Um, uh, I couldn't but um, uh, think uh, that 23 years back, uh, February, 1999, I started my professional career from BIASS. So it's indeed an honor and I'm humbled that I've been invited here uh, to come back and speak on this auspicious event of uh, marking Bangladesh-Japan's 50 years of relationship. Um, slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as Bangladesh is celebrating its golden jubilee, we can see that Bangladesh and uh, Japan are, um, uh, is also celebrating their 50 years of relationship, um, a bilateral relationship, which uh, started off from February 10. Japan was one of the earliest countries to grant uh, sovereign recognition uh, to, and uh, recognize the struggle of Bangladeshi people. In this articulation, I have only 15 minutes, I know. I'll try my best to be very fast, quick, and try to uh, highlight the major points. Um, I'm going to emphasize on uh, the rise of the Indo-Pacific region, uh, what is the state of the current world order, and from there on, I'll move on to uh, Bangladesh-Japan relationship and the essence of it. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the talking points. The talking points that I'm going to touch on, a brief historical detour uh, between the um, two countries, um, and then the Indo-Pacific uh, corridor, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, rise of the geopolitical significance and the current international order, Bangladesh's bargaining points, that why uh, you know countries of the world will come to Bangladesh. And then I'm going to highlight uh, the contemporary uh, perspectives on Bangladesh-Japan relations, and I'll have some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as we can see that uh, with the recognition of uh, Bangladesh's struggle of independence in 1971, uh, Bangladesh Japan uh, started uh, this uh, journey bilat of bilateral friendship. Uh, bilateral relationship is marked by high level political visits as mentioned before, I uh, started with Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's visit to uh, uh, Japan in 1973. Um, and uh, it, is, it, is um, it is sort of uh, delivered, uh, it is done with the perspective of uh, our foreign policy foundation also laid out by Bangabandhu do friendship towards uh, friendship to all allies towards none um, as we can see that Bangladesh is um, uh, sort of uh, Bangladesh was considered as a country uh, during its inception as a sovereign country that it has no resources no tangible resources uh, it was a war ravaged economy under this case uh, starting from a number of uh, state actors as well as international financial institutions and, and uh, economic experts argued that Bangladesh is nothing but a test case of development and the survival of Bangladesh was viability was questioned uh, in in several ways. Uh, so during that period of time, Japan was one of the few countries that lended its undivided support to Bangladesh and uh, helped Bangladesh, assist Bangladesh in a manner so that Bangladesh's journey can take a positive direction. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, much has been talked already about uh, um, the rise of the Indo-Pacific. Um, as we can see, the, the very uh, uh, coinage of the term Indo-Pacific was done in 1920s by a German scholar, uh, on uh, expert on geopolitics, uh, Karl Hauschofer. Um, as we can see, as the center of gravity shifted to the West uh, during the Cold War period, Indo-Pacific region, which was seen as a geographical uh, whole, uh, the, the whole entire uh, land, uh, land centric perspective uh, and mixture of it with maritime you know, uh, uh, perspective. So this shift actually uh, brought uh, the centrality of Indo-Pacific region to the uh, back of uh, international politics. But again, we can see how um, with the rising Easternization of the world, with the rise of an Asia that can say no, we can see how Indo-Pacific has once again come in vogue in the understanding of the policymakers. Here we can, I can cite just two examples that um, how America in its two ocean policy shifted, uh, these being Atlantic and Pacific to Pacific and Indian Ocean. Similarly, China in its two ocean policy, it prioritizes uh, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So here we can find that how uh, this, the idea of uh, uh, the rise of an Asia that can say no, it was conceptualized first by a Japanese uh, uh, politician and uh, scholar Shintaro Ishihara uh, in 1986, when he wrote along with the former um, uh, Malaysian Prime Minister um, Mahathir Mohamad. And from there on, uh, the rise of an Asia that 
can say no rise of a japan that can say no rise of a china that can say no and and i'm hoping that in my lifetime i'll see rise of a bangladesh that can also say no so this whole discourse started to emerge um, however when we talk about international order we can see how we are living in a very dangerous time we find the find the international order to be fluid quite unstable at present why because there is a lack of clearly discernible poles of power as we have seen during the cold war we can argue a, a lot of uh, you know um, um, sort of uh, ways if cold war was beneficial or it affected uh, foreign policies of the world despite that we have a, we had a kind of structural stability uh, the two dragons were fighting and all the other animals they were you know uh, hiding but now as we can see uh, at the end of the cold war um, uh, we can see a very unstable international order uh, next uh, slide please so what do we see now? Often uh, scholars have started to point out that we live in a plurilateral world where states' uh, policies are followed by their immediate or uh, short-term interest. And therefore, their long-term interest or their long-term friendship that were that were forged before, thus those are often forgotten. Not only that, we can see a mushrooming emergence of a number of security alliances or cooperative framework. Often they may not make a long-term you know, implications for international politics, then again, states with competing interests are banding together. For example, uh, Quad and BRICS. This is uh, uh, an example that comes to my mind that same members are in Quad and in BRICS. And then how, how are they functioning uh, uh, and uh, their policies, how they are being affected? Uh, also, we can see that how uh, a number of alliances which were forged before, often uh, they come and they, they work only during the time of need. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, these, uh, with uh, along with Imtiasar, I mean, I also, whenever I'm talking about Bangladesh, I cannot but point out that we can see that from where Bangladesh has started and where Bangladesh has reached. Uh, in 1971, uh, we can see GDP was just 8 billion and now it's 320 billion. How, uh, you know, life expectancy has uh, risen. How we have started with almost no foreign currency, uh, foreign, foreign reserve, but then where we have gone and how agricultural productivity has increased. So, it has been a sort of a holistic sort of uh, emergence, a holistic sort of development of Bangladesh, where we have not only emphasized on, you know, the way other countries see security, that is in traditional sense, uh, uh, maintaining security. Instead, we have emphasized on non-traditional aspects of uh, security. So next slide, please. Yeah, so how, uh, you know, a number of scholars have pointed out Bangladesh surprise, Bangladesh miracle, et cetera, et cetera, that Bangladesh does not have any tangible resources, how Bangladesh has, uh, you know, come to uh, this stage today. I, uh, you know, le let me take a leaf from Robert Frost's famous uh, poem. Uh, Bangladesh has rather pursued a road not taken because Bangladesh has not followed the typical uh, Western model of development, that is industrialization. There will be a trickle down. Rostro, uh, famous economist Rostro provided this idea this is the only way for newly decolonized states to you know, develop their economies. But Bangladesh has not followed this typical path. What Bangladesh has done, Bangladesh has rather harnessed the little resources that we have. We have maintained a steady economic policy, a strong and robust leader, political leadership, and we have paid attention to our internal developments. And that is why during the entire COVID period, people all around the world were questioning whether our statistics was right or whether we are hiding something. We are not hiding something. Rather, we have seen that although uh, globally number of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, number of um, 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 uh, hunger has increased, but in Bangladesh, what we have done, we have been able to circulate our resources internally in a manner so that there are less num number of people who have been affected by COVID, who have gone hungry, who have uh, uh, died because of lack of food. So the uh, internally, how we have sort of emphasized on uh, farm uh, expansion of farm agriculture, fisheries, and so many other ways, uh, internal entrepreneurship developed. This is something often they do not fall within the typical, uh, you know, models of economic uh, economics. And that is why one of the scholars eco um, in the economic area, um, Akhtar Mahmood has pointed out that Bangladesh has taken following the, you know, uh, song of um, um, forgetting that I did it my Frank Sinatra's song that I did it my way. So Bangladesh has also taken a road less traveled and we have done it in our way, which may come as a surprise. So what has been at the heart of that another external aspect is development diplomacy. Bangladesh has not followed only uh, economic diplomacy as we see it, but rather we 
emphasized cultivating relationship with countries who can come forward to our economic you know, uh, sort of development needs. As mentioned earlier, that our foreign, uh, honorable foreign minister has asserted that Bangladesh's door is open to any countries of the world who comes up with economic opportunities. So as uh, Professor Imtiaz has also pointed out that Bangladesh is one of the few countries or perhaps the only country in the world where growth has happened without enmity, a shining example of a growth without enmity country. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so next slide will point out that uh, Bangladesh's, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, um, uh, donation and loans, uh, loans and grants made to Bangladesh. And as you can see, why I'm emphasizing that Bang uh, Japan has been one of the uh, formidable partner in Bangladesh's growth, that uh, Japan has provided the uh, 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 highest uh, amount of loan as well as grant compared to our other uh, sort of uh, partners uh, in these cases. Next slide, please. What are other bargaining points that Bangladesh can offer to the rest of the world? We have seen in the, in the typical literature in 70s, 80s, even 90s, we have often argued that Bangladesh is a landlocked country, that Bangladesh has been a victim of geography. But by virtue of getting unhindered access to the Bay of Bengal, Bangladesh has rather emerged as a country based by geography. Uh, the then Japanese uh, ambassador in 2014 identified Bangladesh's linchpin position at the mouth of the Bay of Bengal uh, and its potential to act as an Indo-Pacific corridor. Now, Bay of Bengal has provided us a, a, a shift from being land-centric def definition of neighborhood to a maritime-centric definition of a neighborhood. Here we find that uh, we call uh, the Bay of Bengal as our third neighbor. Not only that, uh, one other thing that I would like to point out that why Bay of Bengal is so significant. Uh, Imtiasar was talking about colonialism. Let us think of a world where there is uh, no boats are invented because entire period of colonialism, it, it, has, it is done through, you know, maritime routes. Uh, Columbus discovered America or the British coming to South Asia. It is, they have entered through Bay of Bengal. So entire colonialism in different parts of the world, this has done through maritime centers. Once again, in 21st century, we are seeing how maritime choke points, maritime routes, these have become uh, SLOCs, uh, sea lens of communication. These have acquired a new strategic significance for us. And that is why the importance of Bay of Bengal cannot be overstated from Bangladesh's perspective. Uh, also, let us not forget we are a market of 168 uh, million people. Um, uh, look at the geographic expanse of Russia, the largest country of the world and their number of population. And uh, we are, uh, uh, we are, uh, we have 168 million population by, uh, by now, by 2040, our population will cross 200 million people. And this is the time that we need to identify who our friends and how can we make a more habitable place habitable bangladesh uh, in 18 years of time and so here also i would like to point out that bangladesh in its 50th anniversary the 50th anniversary as an independent sovereign country it has emerged as a, a, a middle power or uh, in uh, other words uh, bangladesh is often called as an emerging middle power yes given its geo geographic position given its uh, uh, you know uh, smaller geographic expanse uh, i'm not inclined to call bangladesh as a small country in a typical sense but rather bangladesh is an emerging middle power which is uh, uh, pointing out that it can also play the role of an agenda setter in international politics. Now, Bangladesh does not need to uh, be an agenda setter in all matters um, uh, in international politics. We are rather, uh, we have pointed out in 2020, in 2021, in UN General Assembly and in other international forums that when it comes to Bangladesh's interests, we want to be included in agenda setting role. So from there on, we have seen the rise of a already a, a strong, robust and, a, and a, a Bangladesh in a, in a different manner. Uh, so uh, that is where I find a new Bangladesh is emerging. Next slide, please. Uh, now, um, we're talking, going to talk about Bangladesh-Japan friendship, how it has matured over time. Uh, so a number of, uh, you know, uh, statistics that we already have. Uh, Bangladesh is the highest recipient of uh, ODA um, uh, from Japan. Uh, and um, here we can see as uh, Japan uh, joined in the uh, DAC committee, the uh, uh, Development Assistance Committee uh, uh, in 1961 and made its first grant in 1968. Since then, Japan has taken uh, uh, an active interest 
interest in, in being uh, one of the top donors. And uh, although the position varied, but uh, Japan has generally been one of the five leading donors of the world. Uh, financial assistance from Japan saw a big boost since the uh, development of comprehensive partnership between Japan and Bangladesh uh, since 2014. In fiscal year 2021, Japan provided more aid to Bangladesh than any other country, which amounted to $2.63 billion. Uh, since Bangladesh's independence, uh, Japan has provided a total of $24.72 uh, billion, almost evenly split between grants and loans. And here we can see that why uh, we need Japan by our side in our endeavor to emerge as a Bangladesh that can say no. Um, next slide, please. Then for Bangladesh, uh, getting grants and loans are not only uh, uh, aspect of uh, bilateral relations. Uh, Japan is uh, Bangladesh's top export destination in Asia. This is this importance cannot be overstated. As you can see, that uh, uh, the uh, balance of trade is almost you know uh, closing by uh, 1.3 billion um, 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 export uh, from Bangladesh, whereas Bangladesh imported what 1.8 billion. So now I, I believe that we need to work on how this uh, balance of uh, trade can be uh, reduced between the two countries for Bangladesh. Once again, uh, as our uh, most um, exports go to uh, uh, Western countries, especially in Europe and in uh, Ameri uh, America and Canada, North America, and there in uh, New Zealand and Australia, we need to cultivate other uh, uh, export destinations as well and play it on our strength. In terms of business, we can see that uh, the Pew Research in 2014 identified Bangladesh as one of the top uh, 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 pro-Japanese country with 71% favorable view towards Japan in Asia. Uh, similarly, Japanese Ministry of Commerce identified in uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021 that Japanese businessmen, they hold a pro-Bangladeshi view, and especially after uh, the COVID pandemic, during the COVID pandemic, when Japanese uh, uh, money is shifting uh, from uh, China, Bangladesh is considered as one of the uh, key destinations for that money. Uh, now let us talk about connectivity and other issues. Next slide, please. Um, so Big B, uh, the big strategic initiative which envisions an integration of Asian region. Uh, for Bangladesh, particularly economic infrastructure, energy and development imperatives, that is where Japan and Bangladesh are committed to work together. Uh, so here we can see a number of projects that have already been mentioned. Um, for example, MRT line in Dhaka, uh, our very uh, uh, um, sort of beneficial deep sea port at Matarbari, um, the terminal three of um, Hazrat International Airport in Dhaka and the economic zone at Arai Hajar. All of these are central to Big B, a part of Big B plans that are being carried out by Japan here. Connectivity in this world of connectography, wherever we are staying, uh, uh, we need to sort of expand our reach and uh, reach to other areas as well. So the importance of connectivity, which Parak Khanna has identified is the arms race of 21st century, cannot once again be overstated. Here we can see Japan and Bangladesh have mutual interest in developing uh, Bangladesh uh, as a key player in the Asian region. So here, uh, of course, uh, Japanese plans are uh, uh, connecting the Cox's Bazaar with Rakhine. And I would argue that, yes, Rohingya issue is there. Of course, we need to develop our relationship on this. We need more uh, donors. We need more friends uh, to work on the Rohingya issue. But at the same time, bangladesh Myanmar relationship cannot be, uh, you know, be holden, uh, uh, cannot be holden to only Rohingya issue. We need to expand it to other areas. And therefore, we need Japan and other countries to come forward uh, in developing further business interests and developing other areas of uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar relations, uh, because it is our neighbor. We can change a lot of things. We can change uh, uh, you know, our job places. We can change our friends, but we cannot ignore our geographic position. We cannot take Bangladesh out of South Asia and place it where it is convenient for us to. So we have to learn to live with uh, uh, Myanmar. We have to learn to live with India, our biggest neighbor. And this is, uh, once again, we need to uh, carefully sort of treat through. Uh, last but not the least is that the growing uh, geopolitical significance of the of the uh, Indo-Pacific region and the Bay of Bengal in light of Bangladesh uh, uh, holding the IORA chairmanship uh, from last year. Uh, so here, Bangladesh can work on, along with uh, Japan, uh, 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 developing a number of cooperative mechanisms which will have some institutional base, 
as well as it will have it will include both uh, uh, non state actors civil society mem members track to diplomacy track 1.5 diplomacy through which we will uh, get to learn about each other uh, last last slide please uh, I hope I've, I've not taken much of your time. So let us uh, just come to uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, going back in history because uh, we cannot move forward if we don't don't look at the past, don't look at the history. It is often said that uh, uh, the well of the past is too deep. So we need to go back and see how historically Japan Bangladesh relationship developed, matured, and we have many more potentials. As I say at the, at the beginning, that more. Uh, communalities are there to bind us then pointing out the differences between Bangladesh and Japan. So we need to look at more people to people connectivity, people to people contact so that we get to know each other. Uh, and uh, we need to take uh, instead of a top down approach to a sort of uh, an approach where uh, a sociological understanding of international relations, that is state is not the only actor, but we also need non state actor level relation development of relationship. So we can see how Monobushu scholarship and a number of other scholarship has created a sort of a, a critical mass in Bangladesh who know about Japan who want to uh, learn more about Japan and promote Japan. So public diplomacy can be a great tool for Japan to make itself more visible um, in uh, Bangladesh as uh, and uh, I cannot but uh, stress that uh, the world is growing more volatile, uh, even as we speak. Uh, so we need more friends uh, uh, at this very juncture, so that Bangladesh in its immediate, uh, you know, issues, immediate uh, problems, we can find Japan always by our side. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Lali for Yasmin for uh, running us through uh, 50 years of Bangladesh-Japan relations. Um, of course, it's a very important um, uh, bilateral relation, and I'm sure that in the days ahead, um, it will flourish further. Uh, we have now come to our last speaker, um, uh, who is again um, from waiting uh, for us in, in, in Tokyo. Uh, it's an honor to uh, introduce Professor um, uh, uh, Takahara Akio, who, who is a professor of contemporary Chinese politics at the Graduate School of Law and Politics and Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. He has spent several years as visiting scholar at the Consulate General of Japan in Hong Kong, the Japanese Embassy in Beijing, Harvard University, Peking University, the Marketer Institute for China Studies, and the Australian National University. He served as president of the Japan Association for Asian Studies and as secretary general of the New China-Japan uh, Friendship uh, 21st Century Committee. He currently serves as senior adjunct fellow of the Japan Institute of International Affairs, distinguished research fellow of the Japan Forum on International Relations and director of JICA Ogata Sadako Research Institute for Peace and Development. Professor uh, Takahara, will uh, speak uh, on free and open Indian Ocean, um, um, uh, maritime cooperation, Japan's initiative. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you, Professor. Thank you. Yes, Professor Rashid Zaman, thank you so much. Um, I hope you can hear me well. All yes, right. we can hear you. Yes. Ah, very good, thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, to you and to the organizers for providing me with this wonderful opportunity um, Professor Yasmin just talked about education, but I actually, through the presentations, I have learned already a lot about uh, Bangladesh. Now, let me uh, share the slides with you. Uh, sorry, this is the last page. So my topic is FOIP and Maritime Cooperation, Japan's initiative, and I'm going to be brief. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the time because um, Professor Kikuchi has actually uh, given us the big picture and said almost everything that's need to be said about Japan's idea about the free and open Indo-Pacific. So what I would like to do is to focus on uh, Japan's maritime cooperation, especially focusing on the Coast Guards and what JICA, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, has been doing to give some substance to the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, my idea of the three pillars that uphold POIP are as follows. First, commitment for peace and stability. We all love the status quo, right? We don't want any country to, um, to destabilize the order, uh, the rules-based order that we have been enjoying for decades. 
So uh, peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific uh, comes uh, paramount. And also, uh, in order to uh, achieve that, we need promotion and establishment of the rule of law, freedom of navigation, and free trade. These principles are, of course, important to uh, both the Bangladeshis and the Japanese and the rest of the region. And at the same time, we would like to pursue economic prosperity, uh, construct connectivity. Uh, that's what we've been doing in Bangladesh and other countries. So these three uh, tasks that we have in under the um, concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific is something that JICA is has been uh, ta tackling. Now you don't know, um, you don't need to be told about how Japanese ODA uh, functions. So it's categorized into bilateral assistance and multilateral assistance. Bilateral assistance can be divided into three parts: technical cooperation, ODA loan, and grant aid. And all of these are involved when we uh, implement uh, maritime. Uh, cooperation. Uh, in the area of technical cooperation, and now I'm going into the details of what we actually do in uh, our projects. Um, we have the technical cooperation uh, projects, the training programs on all sorts of uh, issues like maritime safety and security policy. You know, we help the officers develop their ability to design a good policy and implementation of, of them. Uh, maritime law enforcement, how do you do policing uh, on, on the, in, in the seas? Uh, search and rescue, of course, disa disaster prevention, environmental protection, all these are very important. Um, also, uh, ship safety, hydrography for charting and disaster management. Uh, all these programs we have been conducting with our friends in the region. Uh, so you can see some photos here anti-piracy training, uh, vessel operation training. Uh, we also do forensic training, martial arts. <laughs> uh, this is uh, with Japanese characteristics, perhaps, uh, preventing the spilled oil environmental protection uh, operations and search and rescue, all sorts of programs uh, uh, there. Okay, uh, that was technical cooperation on the grant aid and ODA loans. There are many examples that I can cite here too. As uh, Ambassador Ito mentioned, we have um, provided uh, your country with 24 boats, uh, four 20 meter boats and uh, 20 10 meter boats uh, for uh, rescue. Uh, also to other countries, we provide uh, patrol vessels uh, also. Uh, we provide all sorts of um, systems for vessel traffic service, uh, laser camera, uh, direction finder, night vision devices, and uh, other communication systems and lighthouses and boy systems. So what have you. Uh, in, so in the Indo-Pacific region, if I uh, cite the countries that we provide these um, uh, programs and facilities, they include Djibouti, Bangladesh, of course, uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, Palau, the Solomon Islands, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. So these are the concrete uh, things that we've been doing. And, um, you know, together with the big picture, I think it's important to understand uh, these uh, details uh, to get a full picture of what the Japanese not only have been trying to do, but actually have been uh, implementing in the region. And uh, finally, I think this is... Um, the slide that I want uh, to show you to tell you about our relations with China in the context of the free and open Indo-Pacific. And as Professor Kikuchi has also already mentioned, you know, it's very important not only to compete with China on the one hand over the strategic or the geopolitical side of things. We don't really want to, but uh, I think we are forced to compete with them on the one hand, but at the same time, we need to cooperate them uh, with them and have uh, a lot of dialogues with them. And in fact, that's what we've been doing. But how can we do that in the context of the free and open Indo-Pacific? Because many people think that the free and open Indo-Pacific is something that we have brought up to counter the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative, but that's not necessarily the case. And as I uh, emphasize here, uh, FOIP and BRI are compatible. You know, to think about this question, uh, first of all, we need to identify what the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, is. 
but it's very difficult because the Chinese have not given any clear definition uh, what the BRI is. The, the way they define it is under BRI, we can achieve this, we can do, do that, uh, but then what is the BRI? It's not very easy to give a clear definition of what that is. But the concept itself is, I think, uh, a creation of a genius because it sounds so nice. It sounds so attractive. Uh, you know, there are so many projects that the Chinese have been conducting uh, in the region, uh, and they're just like stars. So I liken the concept of the BRI to a constellation in the sky. So there are so many stars in the sky, and Xi Jinping points at the sky and say, look at those stars. You see a dragon there. You see a constellation there. That is the Belt and Road Initiative. And we go, wow. Uh, it sounds so good, it looks so good, and you know our eyes are glittering with uh, renminbi. Uh, but I don't think anybody has actually seen a constellation in reality, because constellations don't exist in reality. They are only images in our brains. So the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is just like that, and that's why I deliberately uh, wrote the word constellation in bright yellow so that you can't see it very well. Um, and if I was pushed to define what BRI is, I would say it's a, a signature project of Xi Jinping's and it's the symbol of Xi Jinping's power and authority in the world. So we should not be mesmerized. We should not be dazzled uh, by the constellation, by the concept. And we should rather look at the stars, which are tangible, you know, we should look at the projects. And if we find the projects are good, you know, as uh, Mr. Abe, Shinzo Abe uh, said in 2017, if the projects meet four conditions, then Japan would like to cooperate with the BRI. You know, it's the openness, it's the uh, transparency, it's the economic viability, and it's the fiscal healthiness of the recipient nation. If all these four conditions are met, uh, Japan is willing to cooperate with the BRI. Uh, so we are hoping that Xi Jinping in the future can say the same about uh, the free and open in the Pacific. Uh, he can put some conditions, and if those conditions are met, uh, China can cooperate with the Japanese version of the free and open in the Pacific. That's what we want him to say. And there is a possibility, you know, some people say, oh, no, that's not possible at all. Look at all the competition and uh, you know the troubles that we have. But if you read, for example, the uh, Sino-Russo joint statement that came out on the first day of the Beijing Winter Olympics on the 4th of uh, February, both uh, Russia and China say uh, they are highly vigilant about the American strategy of the free and Indo, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. That's what they say very clearly. It's the American strategy of FOIP that they are worried about. Uh, I would say that they, the phrase they use is a deliberate one uh, because they know that FOIP and BRI, both of them, have two aspects. One aspect is the strategic aspect. Here, the two uh, ideas clash. But the other aspect is economic cooperation. And the Americans are focusing on the former, and the Japanese emphasize the latter. And if we focus on the latter aspect, that is economic cooperation, the Belt and Road Initiative, and the Free and Open in the Pacific can coexist completely together. We can actually share a star, a, two constellations, can share a star or two or three, no problem, and say it's part of our constellation. They can say it's part of their constellation, uh, but we can actually cooperate. And I hope Bangladesh can help us in finding a good star, in designing, formulating a good star, and implementing these pro projects uh, so that we can uh, achieve a symbolic uh, project um, where uh, FOIP and BRI are connected. I'll stop here. Thank you very much.
thank you, Professor Takahara, for a, a very interesting presentation. Um, we will now shift to the question answer session. And I'm sure that there are a lot of questions because we have had four great presentations. Um, I purposefully did not um, use my weight uh, to limit the speakers. Uh, even though Intelsa did remind me that um, I did send him a note. Uh, the reason for that is uh, there are questions, but before that we need to listen to what the speakers have to say, which is very, very important. And only then can we ask questions. So before I move on to the question answer session, just a few um, uh, uh, words for, for the distinguished audience. Um, Number one, um, I have been informed by BIS uh, that um, an evaluation sheet has been uh, circulated to all the participants. Please, and this also includes uh, those who are connected online. Uh, may I remind the audience that uh, please, please do fill up the evaluation form and hand it over. You can also do it online uh, so that uh, BIS authorities will have a good idea as to how we are going to uh, conduct um, such hybrid uh, programs in, in the days ahead. Um, as far as the question answer session is concerned, uh, if you are asking, if you are participating through Zoom, uh, uh, please uh, you can ask the question in the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, important thing is that you introduce yourself before making the intervention. The same also applies for uh, those of us who are in the audience. My request to everyone would be that uh, we would like to hear uh, from as many people as possible, and I'm sure that there are a lot of questions. So please ensure that your questions are brief and and. Um, and, and state clearly uh, who would you like to answer the question. Also, uh, uh, the participants themselves, uh, that is the panelists themselves, if they have any question um, um, uh, for the fellow panelists, um, um, the floor is also uh, for them um, uh, to, to ask such questions. So um, with that, uh, uh, let me start. Um, so anyone? Yes. Uh, for an honorable foreign secretary, Shamshir Mubin Chodhri, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, thanks to BISS for organizing this seminar, which is extremely timely and relevant for all of us. <clears throat> and just to reassure you that I have not only filled up the evaluation form, I've also put my signature on it so that I own it. Uh, my, I'll start uh, very briefly on the point raised by the ambassador of Japan when he emphasized on the issue of rule of uh, rule-based international order. I think that is a very fundamental issue that we have to look on. And if I may just take a second to speak of a specific instance where Japan and Bangladesh handled a very serious and a critical situation on a rule-based international order. This was the 1977 hijack of a Japan Airlines plane to Bangladesh, where I was the negotiator, one of part of the negotiating team for all four days. It was an act of piracy. It was an illegal act internationally, but both Bangladesh and Japan governments of the day handled it and resolved it without resorting to any form of violence. It was resolved very maturely by both the sides, no loss of life, no loss of face. It was a small, but I think it was a relevant incident of the degree of maturity which Bangladesh and Japan looks at the relationship. My specific question is to uh, Lailufa Yasmin. She has... Uh, kind of uh, oh, taken ownership of the word uh, Bangladesh that can say no, uh, which I support her fully. But can I ask her, why can't Bangladesh also say yes if it meets our preservation of our national, economic, social, political, and regional interests in the larger maritime area? Uh, my third point, uh, Mr. Chair, is I think Bangladesh military, Army, Navy, and Air Force, today has the capability to play a visible role. I when I say play, I do not mean an aggressive role, but a peaceful friendship role where Bangladesh can extend. I mean, we are in the IOR, we are, we are in the Bay of Bengal. Why not have more repeated military exercises with all the stakeholders in the region, with all the stakeholders in the region, be it Australia, Japan, uh, India, and China, and others, if, if, if I think we are in a position to do it, which will not necessarily be provocative, but which will also demonstrate that we are in a position to do that. And Bangladesh today has achieved that, that, uh, that status. Uh, also, I think you, Chairman, use the word rise of Indo-Pacific. Uh, Indo-Pacific is not the mythical Atlantic, Atlantis ocean that sank and has rise again. It has always existed. It has always existed, and it, it is for us now to make uh, the best use of it. 
uh, I think uh, we are, uh, again, thank you very much. And thanks to BISS for this very, very important and relevant seminar. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, is there anyone else who would like to? Uh, let us take two or three questions, and then I think then we can we can have the questions. Yes, uh, uh, Ambassador Foyes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I join the previous speaker to congratulate B Abyss on hosting this very important and very timely uh, seminar, hybrid seminar, as it is being mentioned so many times. But it's uh, the topic is so important that. We have so many questions and comments, but I'll limit myself to two comments and a question. The first comment is uh, on the uh, address by the Japanese ambassador. Excellency ambassador, you said something about Bhashan Chor should form part of the long-term solution. I would like to say that that should not be the case because Bhashanchar is a temporary solution. It can be used as a model for finally settling these people in their own homes in Myanmar, but it cannot be the, uh, a part of the permanent so, uh, long-term solution. Uh, I hope that if you want to uh, reply to that, you might, but that is just a comment from me. And the other comment that I would like to make here is on Professor Kikuchi's uh, presentation. A very small comment, but I see this word being used by not only Professor Kikuchi, but others as well. Game, great game over future of Asia. Future of Asia should not be seen as a game. I think we should, uh, this, the moment we use the word game, it becomes, uh, it uh, carries all kinds of meanings that we do not want, like, we do not relish. So I think uh, that is something that we should reconsider. And my question. <clears throat> This whole seminar is about geopolitics, as it says. So usually geopolitics, the term geopolitics is used to mean or explain rivalries, rival alliances, conflicting interests, exclu exclusion, confrontation. Can we, my question is, can we change that and use it to explain friendship, cooperation, inclusion, complementarities. So some of the speakers mentioned about complementarities and then shared development and prosperity. Working together to maximize advantages and minimize shortcomings so that we can all benefit. Thank you. May I remind the audience that we also have uh, uh, participants who are connected to us through the Zoom. So uh, if you permit me, I will take one question from uh, one of the Zoom participants and then I'll, I'll again come back to the audience. So I'll, I'll come back to you, sir, certainly. So our next question is from uh, Major General Retired um, Shohidul Haq. Uh, sir, please go ahead and, and ask your question. He's connected to us through Zoom. Nayan, can you send me the question? Okay, so I, I think we can we can come back to uh, Major Shahidul Haq later, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is Hanan, former ambassador of Bangladesh. Uh, I found very interesting element from the reflection of Professor Kikuchi that he floated the idea of new bilateral and the uh, minilateralism as a concept uh, for trade and development. And he utterly emphasized on the rule-based system or engagement. My question is how Professor Kikuchi would like to reconcile the fundamental principles of his proposed new bilateralism and minilateralism with the existing multilateral trading system, I mean WTO. 
my other point on Professor uh, uh, Akio, and he mentioned three pillars, very interesting. And uh, he highlighted the elements very pertinent for Bangladesh development and uh, the Japan's initiative for maritime cooperation. I believe that is most important for Bangladesh and the policymakers may like to take, give a serious consideration for a meaningful engagement because this maritime cooperation as proposed by Japan uh, would help Bangladesh for its much required capacity building and skill development for its diversification and competitiveness in trade and development and ultimate sustainability in view of its Bangladesh's graduation as a developing country. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I've got uh, only a few questions in this round. Uh, one was um, pointed out uh, by Ambassador, um, uh, and then uh, why are we calling the rise of Indo-Pacific? Um, in fact, uh, the, for the lack of better expression, Indo-Pacific, as I mentioned, it was already coined in 1920s uh, by, uh, um, the, actually, the um, Karl Haushofer is considered as the uh, sort of a scholar who initiated the world geopolitics as well uh, in, in from Germany, uh, geo and politics. Um, so uh, from there on, it was already there, but due to the political shifts, as Sar mentioned in during his presentation, honey's, uh, you know, uh, the pot of honey shifted to the West. So therefore geopolitics, and especially with a couple of other developments, the um, sort of uh, the invention of ICBMs uh, and the uh, importance um, um, that is put on strategies, uh, Cold War politics, all of this geopolitics and uh, also was seen as responsible for the starting of the Second World War. All of these issues gradually sort of shifted uh, the idea from, uh, you know, geopolitics uh, from Indo-Pacific to the other region. Second, uh, why Bangladesh can also say, uh, why can Bangladesh also not say yes? In fact, when I uh, mention about the concept of an Asia that can say no, a Japan that can say no, a Japan, uh, a China that can say no, possibly a rise of a Bangladesh that can say no, what I'm trying to assert is that a positive assertiveness coming from a country so that it can make its policies clear in international politics and to the other countries. It does not mean that we are indiscriminately going to say no to everyone. It means a mixture of yes and no. And we would be able to do that with our you know, backs high up, our, our chin up, that yes, this is what I am I, agreeing to. And yes, this is I'm not agreeing to. That does not mean saying no to everything. But it refers to positive assertive posture of a country in international politics. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um... On the on the issue of geopolitics, uh, uh, whether uh, one whether one can have geopolitics of cooperation. Keep in mind, you know, when the word was uh, invented, uh, that is uh, late nineteenth century and early twentieth century. Uh, we don't live in that world. This is a globalized world. It's impossible to go back to Karl Hossefer. Humans can never go back. You know, we can always go forward. Uh, even present is, the physics has pointed out, present is meaningless because present doesn't work because the moment you say present, it becomes past. So the point here is we need to, when we say geopolitics, of course, we need to see the context of the cooperation that has happened. Take, for example, uh, uh, Japan. Uh, today, I think from 2021, uh, China has become, uh, they have, you know, US is, is China actually when it comes to trade relationship with Japan. Uh, Japan's trade relationship with China from 2021 is more than its relationship with the US. Uh, and, and these are the changes that's almost, you can't reverse it overnight. So in the context of globalization, and this is why globalization and the decolonization is so important because you, we can't go back to colonialism. That's an impossibility. Okay, so with decolonization comes globalization and the re-rise of the Asian economies. Uh, some of these economies uh, have been you know, very old. They're, they're part of old civilizations. 
and of course they would have their uh, what you call um, their originality and also uh, the uh, you know something which which goes uh, with their uh, context let's let's talk about bangladesh i think lalifur has talked about why bangladesh has made a difference of not taking the western path well if you look at economics as a discipline it has always focused on scarcity and i've always pointed out that it's a it's a, it's a problem it's a problem because if you are focusing on scarcity then you would end up with fear and it reproduces fears it becomes a psychological issue now in bangladesh context although the economics have been you know projecting fear after fear after fear still somehow it looks like it's a miracle and all because the business people who probably were not so much interested in the economic theory at all they focused on something very different and not scarcity they focused on abundance so if you look historically some of the economies and i can actually also try to convince you that even europe they when they shifted from second world war and became what they became also because they focused on abundance particularly with coal and steel and not on scarcity so bangladesh because they focused on abundance and what we had in abundance was people take two categories which made bangladesh economy what it is today two categories then it will help you to understand one is of course remittances our migrants is abundance we have huge number of people so when globalization was without globalization you could not have used uh, these migrants remittances economic you know kind of developing middle east malaysia singapore way back most of the high rise building that that you see in singapore way back now the technology has changed all were made by bangladeshis laborers so one is migrants and the second one is ready made garments again you need people and that what made the difference and why people and this is interesting women 90% our women actually in our ready made garments and what made a difference because we had people who focused on um, on the women particularly the ngos and here you have, one has to credit uh, you know uh, uh, gramin and also brack and other ngos because they focused on the women so when the ready made garments came the women could come out of the village to the cities and work and no south asian countries others can replicate this particular context so abundance i think can also make a difference and i will also emphasize that if bangladesh government wants to go ahead the other thing that they need to focus is ship building where also in the initial phase you need abundance you need a lot of people uh, for ship building to come up and and you have seen already it is coming up a little bit but it has a potential which is huge thank you uh professor kikuchi would you like to answer ambassador hanna's question is professor kikuchi connected we can uh, go back to professor kikuchi lekha i already have two hands i'll, I'll come to you um, uh, uh, mr abdul uh, mohanan choudhury so uh, ex foreign state minister for foreign affairs um, sir would you like to ask a question professor abul hasan choudhury can i can i see right now no i'm muted okay i can speak right now i think sir just one minute sir okay, sir. <laughs> okay. I have uh, some very very brief comments but before that I too would like to join the other speakers in congratulating BIISS and the embassy of Japan for organizing the seminar today uh, you see when we look at the Bangladesh Japan relations mm -hmm. it involves a retrieval of history uh, one of the countries which believed in us when even the most fantastic fantasy uh that was there in 1971 does not quite match the glittering reality in economic terms that we have achieved today but that was not the scenario and that was why perhaps it was only relevant that the greatest bengali of all times the father of the nation 
Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman so early after independence visited Japan, as indeed mm. long 21 years after the brutal assassination of, of Bangabandhu and his uh, most members of his family, except our Honorable Prime Minister and her younger sister, Sheikh Rihanna, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina was very keen to visit Japan soon after 1996. And I was greatly honored uh, to be in her entourage when we went to Japan as my very distinguished friend, the Honorable Chief Guest, Mr. Farooq Khan, uh, for whom I have very great admiration, knows so well. Uh, what we discussed at that time, to build relationships, would you not be depend on government or exigencies of the situation. And therefore, I think that the Chairman, uh, uh, Ambassador Kazim Tiaz Hussain and Brigadier General Maksudur Rahman and whoever in the BIS has taken part in this uh, must be congratulated. Now, my brief comment is this. Over the years, starting from Bangabandhu's enunciated theory of friendship towards all and malice towards none, and I'm in the company of many intellectual scholar diplomats here, mm. we have not gone away from that maxim. And therefore, whether it is BRI or whether it is Quad, as long as it is, as long as it is economically beneficial, and the economically beneficial and prosperous Bangladesh is not confined within the 56,000 square miles. It is a prosperity which transcends. Recently, a sister in the of mine in Selfridge has screamed to somewhat embarrassment of her husband when she found that something in Selfridge's, which we know is such a famous departmental store, was made in Bangladesh. So I knew we are getting a little impatient because there are so many speakers. I would straight away make two suggestions. And it stems from my own experience. From 1980 to 85, I was perhaps a little younger then. I was working for a Japanese international bank where I was doing the loan syndication, Kanji Renraku Senketsuken. And I could see the wedding of ethics to making commercial decisions. It was a ringing instruction to us that don't indulge in a loan which creates directly or indirectly to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. I know the world has changed. I know Japanese perceptions have changed. So my specific suggestion would be that as we deepen our cultural ties, and I take advantage of the fact that His Excellency, the Japanese ambassador is present here. Is it not time when our stock exchange is so vibrant, is so strong, and it is drawing attention in the region and abroad, that Japan should have a financial organized institutional arrangement. In other words, banking or stronger exchange, uh, relevance uh, relation to with our stock. Second thing is that with so many things happening, Japan, Bangladesh, I think there should also be a Japan center to bring to our attention that all the possibilities that emerge. Third thing that I would say is the Honorable Prime Minister has very rightly appropriately and on a number of occasions reminded us of the blue economy. This is where I think I would also invite comments of the distinguished and learned speakers uh, that how we can deepen the relationship with China, uh, sorry, uh, with Japan in, in uh, creating uh, an environment where we can get the, as it is even after the maritime boundary solutions, we have gone nowhere near exploiting mm -hmm. the fullest potential of the blue economy. And mm -hmm. the last point must indeed be that Bangladesh has shown unique, unparalleled example by welcoming the oppressed, you know, people who had been subjected to bestial oppression by Myanmar. But in choosing to do so, the 1.1 million refugees who sit here, Bangladesh is committed to creating a condition, a peaceful condition where they can return. But we have not declared Myanmar an adversarial state, which countries like China, which countries like Japan, which our neighbor India should take on board that if this festering uh, problem continues, it is not going to just hamper Bangladesh, it's a global problem, it's a regional problem. And we cannot have either BRI or a multilateral economic uh, uh, cooperation, call it quad or whatever you like, unless this problem is forcibly resolved. By forcibly resolved, I don't mean necessarily by, uh, by, by the power of weapons, but by rather by the language of, by the weapon of language. Thank you very much, Mr. President.
Thank you much, sir. Uh, may I now go back to uh, uh, Professor Kikuji? I think he's waiting yeah. for us. Yeah, Professor thank Kikuji. you. Thank you so yes. much, Chino. Please, I, I, please. Uh, thank you. Yeah, on the, the question on the, you know, the relation between minilateral arrangement and, and also global, you know, multilateralism. Yes, you know, as I pointed out, you know, minilateral arrangement is a quite uh, distinct characteristics we have seen uh, recently. There are so many you know, trilateral arrangements are emerging in, in the Pacific. Why? So, of course, you know, it's a response to uh, changing international relations of these regions. And also, you know, multilateralism doesn't work well. And the bilateral arrangements are not enough to deal with specific issues. So we are looking for some partners and uh, jointly you know, addressing the common challenges such as you know, maritime security or joint training for you know, law enforcement and, and, and so forth. So I think you know, it does not uh, conflict with the uh, you know, international rules or international norms. And out for the economic uh, relations, so you know, the the, the relation with the WTO, a global, you know, government, you know, the global governance institutions. Yes, if you look at the last you know, few decades, we have seen the both process. One is a strengthening global, you know, the multilateral arrangement such as you know, WTO. But at the same time, we have been developing region-based uh, economic arrangements such as you know, the regional free trading arrangement. So in case of Indo-Pacific, recently we had two big regional economic uh, you know, arrangements, such as CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progress uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which Japan you know, took uh, leadership role for you know, conclusion, and also East Asia-based uh, uh, free trading arrangement, so-called uh, ASEAN Plus uh, uh, 6. So both are you know, so-called uh, WTO plus. So, you know, not conflict with the uh, basic uh, rules and norms of WTO, but also we have been strengthening the, the rules, you know, embedded in the global trading arrangement. That is the real, you know, uh, situations. Thank you. So uh, I'll come to you. Uh, uh, Mayor General uh, Amasa Amin, uh, retired. Um, mm -hmm. And and then uh, Mayor General Jibun Kanai Dash. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Hmm. The seminar has been very important. Base rightly deserves to be credited. And at the same time, I must say that um, the 50th celebration of Japan-Bangladesh cooperation has a very high significance to me. I'll not make any questions, but have a comment, though the topic is very important. I have a lot of questions, but I'll know that those questions can't be answered in short. So I'll make a comment literally diverting from the multilateral aspect to bilateral aspect of Japan-Bangladesh cooperation. I reciprocate the views of our ex-foreign minister, our state minister, Mr. Abul Hassan Chaudhary. He talked about the Japan Center. I'd rather expand the idea a little bit more. And uh, I'd like to the Japanese ambassador to kindly consider setting up a vibrant Japan-Bangladesh Center. Why? I'll explain that. We have talked about uh, geopolitics, our relations, economics, but there's something more which normally in the diplomatic circle we don't talk about. And that is, what can we learn from the Japanese modern history? We, knew, we know that Japan was, during the Second World War, a very powerful country, very martial. We had a lot of things that history books have told us. But after post-Second World War, 
Japan totally transformed itself from a country which was dwelling on war to peace. And then their politics also had gone through a very dynamic change. They established a strong democracy, very stable, where I believe, if I'm not wrong, over the last 100 years, they had 70 prime ministers. If I'm wrong, please correct me, Ambassador. And then the culture of politics, political uh, tolerance. S sir, I'm very sorry, that, sir. So if I'll you have a finish, question. I'll just finish just maybe another half a minute. I think we have a lot to learn to ensure our political stability and improve our political culture from what the Japanese have shown over the last uh, 50 years after the Second World War. Thank you. Uh, Mayor General Jibon, can I address uh, your question, please? Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I, th I am the former uh, DG of BISS, and I take pride in seeing that such a beautiful seminar has been organized by BISS right at the beginning of the year. Uh, first, on a lighter note, to Professor Nilofar, who suggested people-to-people -people, uh, contact to be developed more in Japan-Bangladesh relation. And you know, we are uh, training our people to be caregivers and Japan people would need it most. So Ambassador, we are there, right there, sir. Now the term about geopolitics, some people are now using also the term geoeconomics. So this term can also be considered for our future research and other purposes. Now the, the essence of Indo-Pacific region consideration is the rise of China and the consequent uh, situations. Because rise of China is not only confined to the Indo-Pacific, it is it rises in the world. So we have the Middle Kingdom and we have to contest with the rise. In the 80s, when we were China in China, General Mutin was also there. We saw that the money from Taiwan and Japan were flowing in massively. And that was the building blocks of China's rise in those years. Now, coping with the, rise, uh, uh, the China that is now having uh, the number one economy in the world, they have technologies, they have the best of uh, expertise and uh, experiences. So country like Bangladesh cannot afford to lose all the potentials that China has to offer. And China is one of our best friends. Taking an example, India and China being part of the SCO and BRICS and all those things, yet they fought a, war, a sort of warlike situation in 2020. Yet after that, India banned some some sort of programs and applications, but the trade in 2020 was nearly 70 billion and it has risen to 130 billion this year. So this trend is going to continue sir. for Bangladesh also to get benefit from these things. So the question, sir? The question is we should, as a Bangladesh should be selective while taking some sort of resources or, or, or loans from China and uh, we should all to, together uh, consider China is a power to, re to reckon with, and we should be able to live with China. Thank you. OK. Uh, I have a, a question from uh, Lieutenant General Mainul, who is connected uh, with us online. And I, I think uh, both our Japanese uh, professors and, and um, I have already shown this to Professor Imtia, so he's also willing to answer this. The question is, and I, and I quote uh, uh, Lieutenant General Mainul, why no one mentioned presence of US bases in Japan, Korea, Philippines, et cetera, even long after World War II. So we accept that US will continue to dominate terms of the Indo-Pacific, um, end of the question. So if uh, Professor uh, Kikuchi, Professor Takahara, if you would like to uh, say something on this, uh, I think quite interesting question, and then we'll come back to Professor Imtiaz Ahmed. Thank you so much for the question. I think it is um, very clear to anybody that um, uh, to have foreign uh, military bases in your country, there are pros and cons. 
but now we are seeing very clearly why Ukraine wanted to join NATO. Uh, so the answer is very clear, I should think, mm. uh, that this world is not that peaceful as we wish it to be. That's the end of my answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Kikuchi, would you uh, yeah, like to add uh, yeah. anything on as this? I mentioned, you know, as I mentioned, we need to keep U.S. engaged in the Pacific more and more, you know, in the coming decades. And the U.S., you know, basis for the basis, you know, one of the key instrument for keep U.S. engaged in the regions. And as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, U.S.-Japan alliance is a part of the rules-based international order of these regions. So we, through alliance with the United States, we are greatly contributing to the stability and the peace of these regions. So that is the real you know, situation. So I don't know the, any U.S. allies in, 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 in Asia who would like to, you know, the, the delete or abandon the alliance with the United States. So you, alliance on a US basis in Asia is not the instrument US domination that the regions. Thank you. Add on this? Um, I think it's an interesting question, uh, particularly now that we have a situation in Europe um, you know, a lot of uh, scholars, American scholars would say, uh, why NATO is relevant um, or why NATO has become irrelevant. Why Germany would not be allowed to have a gas pipeline on its own. Well, one of the problem is in Germany, as you know, there are 119 US military bases and there's a cost for the military bases. So even during Donald Trump, he tried to argue that you have to raise this cost sharing. It can't be that United States would keep on funding billions of dollars. And he made an interesting argument, and it's, al it's already viral, that we are giving billions of dollars to Germany for your security, but you are pouring billions of dollars to Russia uh, how does it, you know, how can it be appropriate? So the point here is, I think time has come and probably after uh, the Ukraine thing is over uh, for NATO to sit down and see whether NATO is relevant or whether they can do it differently. But I don't think the United States would be in a position to spend that much money. And that brings to the point of Japan having, well, some say 120 military bases, some say 140 military bases of United States in Japan. Now, one argument, and I'm speaking more as, as a researcher, I think one argument would be that helps Japan not to spend money of, of its own on the military. And, and that has helped Japan also to develop in a very big way. So the pros and cons, I think the professor was also pointing out, and that's the pros and, and cons. But the question is, and uh, you know, uh, my Japanese colleague, you know, he pointed out why Ukraine uh, wanted to join. But the question can be put the other way around, why Russia attacked Ukraine? Because I think Russia got terrified to the point how much NATO would shift to the East. Because as you know, NATO, when, you know, before uh, the collapse of Soviet Union, there were only 12 members. Now there are 30 members. So the point is how far it will, and that, is, is a threatening point for Russia, given Russia's history, I think we must not forget that twice uh, it got uh, battered uh, from troops from the West. One, of course, is the Napoleonic War. One has to read Tolstoy's War and Peace and will understand what went through Russia. And second, of course, is Hitler's invasion towards the East. So you can easily see why they would feel threatened when NATO comes up to the border of Ukraine. Now, what's the way out? And this is the brainstorming that is required. Can Japan afford uh, to raise the cost of maintaining uh, the US uh, military bases? Because today or tomorrow, that will come. It has already come in, in different uh, literature as you know how much uh, United States should uh, bear the cost. And what does it do? Does it help 
uh, the geopolitics of cooperation or does it reproduce the geopolitics of conflict? Now that is a brainstorming that is required and I believe we probably would uh, require a longer, longer session and a weekly, a week session so that we can come to some interesting uh, insights. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the second row, and then uh, Lieutenant General Mahmoud Amin will cream at the back. Thank so, you. Please. Thank you, Professor Zaman. It's difficult to recall all the names. This is Salahuddin Ahmed. I was member of Bangladesh Energy Regulatory Commission. I'm also a faculty and TV news broadcaster. I'll go straight to an example that an event recently took place uh, where Dhaka University Associate Professor Ms. Lafifa Jamal, Ms. Lafifa Jamal moderated a, an event of demo made by uh, Professor Takahashi of Robo Garage of Japan, where he showed a very interesting kid-like robots dancing, singing, and giving list of nearby restaurants, etc. And there I heard Takahashi, Professor to mention that he was willing to visit Bangladesh and show it live in front of people, in front of kids who play, in front of youth who studies, who study robotics, and of course, in front of uh, housewives who we call lovingly homemakers to enjoy the service of those robots, young kids like robots. So if the proposed Japan Bangladesh Center comes into being, and starts working, I think this can also be the first or uh, foremost tasks of these centers to mm -hmm. demonstrate, um, to arrange demonstrations of this. And I would love Mr. Takahashi to see here in Bangladesh with those robots and demonstrating those. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Lieutenant General Mohammad Amin al Karim. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. My first question is for uh, <coughs> Professor uh, K K Kikuchi and uh, Professor Takahara. <coughs> My straightforward question is, is Japan following hedging policy against China? If that is so, how are you uh, managing it? Because, uh, <coughs> There is again the power politics, the geopolitics in, involved here. And uh, I think Professor Takahara talked about it, that we are managing China in both ways. And I would tend to call that as a hedging policy. And the literature also says that's a hedging policy. So how do you man managing that hedging policy against China or with China? And my second question would be for all the, uh, all the speakers, anyone can volunteer for that. Do you see the possibility of uh, South China Sea and Bay of Bengal getting intermingled? Some of the ripples of, from South China can enter into uh, the Bay of Bengal. What is the possibility of that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Kikuchi, would you like to go first? Professor Kikuchi, not there. Uh, Professor Takahara, would you like to take the question? No. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Professor, I, I, I think now I can speak. Yes. Yes. I think now I, I can speak. Somehow the the switch is not so smooth, so sometimes we are not allowed to speak, uh, but now I can. Um, right. Uh, I think, you know, China's rise have given a lot of headache to uh, many countries, and Japan has been dubbed as the advanced country in meeting new challenges. You know, it could be the aging society, it could be economic pollution, and facing a rising China has um, been uh, one of those cases. Uh, so, in, especially since uh, China's um, um, rise in their capacities to make maritime advancements, uh, let's say in the past 15 years or so, uh, we have had to face this new challenge 
because they uh, have started to act. You know, they have introduced new policies uh, to make regular patrols and they have actually moving, they have actually been moving uh, towards uh, us. Uh, so this is a reality that we have to face. Uh, but at the same time, as somebody mentioned, uh, economic ties with China is also increasing. So this is a big challenge to us uh, since um, in this simultaneous uh, pursuit of both competition and cooperation, the, co the competition side of things is going to intensify on the one hand, but on the other, cooperation is going to uh, deepen. So the contradiction that's inherent in this policy is going to grow. And that means that internally, we will have a bigger challenge in trying to coordinate different voices and different interests in our own countries. This happens not only in Japan, but in other countries too. And in fact, in China also, they are facing a same, the same contradiction. Uh, they have to compete with us, uh, but at the same time, they need to cooperate with us. So this is a challenge that we are all facing, and I don't care how you call it, <laughs> but that's the reality. And we all need to uh, you know, uh, coordinate our interests and, um, you know, uh, to, as in the words of Professor Kikuchi, stand up to China where we need to and cooperate with, with China uh, where we should and where we want to. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kikuchi, would you like to add uh, anything to what um, uh, Professor Takahiro has just said? Now, now the host has given me the rights to unmute, but I, I, I hope they will give Professor Kikuchi the rights to unmute himself. Can you please unmute uh, no. Dr. Kikuchi? Oh yeah. Oh, now I can speak. Uh, and now, uh, but you know, I hope uh, you know the host allow me to speak and unmute <laughs> my 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 screen. But anyway, I would I, I would fully agree with that. Professor Takahara just uh, mentions. I, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we already have a couple of more questions and since we are running short of time, I will um, ask uh, Mayor General Shahidul Haq, who is uh, connected uh, with us through Zoom link um, to, to ask his question. So the floor is yours. So, so is, is he there? Tarek. Mm. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, my question is that um, what is happening in uh, Ukraine at this moment, which has unfolded uh, the shortcomings of alliances and um, plus uh, the rhetorics and war on the Twitter and social media, uh, I like to ask to the panel that do you think this uh, Quad and IPA are relevant at this moment when one of the member of Quad failed to uh, support the resolution uh, put uh, uh, forwarded by another Quad member in Security Council? Thank you very much. Right, uh, sir, would you like to answer that? OK. Um... No, well, I think the country that uh, you are mentioning is India. India did not uh, abstain. Um, uh, I guess Quad was always a problem if Quad was looked from the perspective of the United States. And India made it very clear from you know several times 
but somehow um, I think the message never went uh, to uh, to Washington. Um, and during the pandemic, I think we have seen the tension between India and and the United States, particularly with the with the vaccine uh, production. As you can, I'm sure uh, some of you are familiar with with the AstraZeneca and and the problem that India had in exporting uh, AstraZeneca to the rest of the world, it had to be stopped. So um, I guess, and that's the reason why the transformation from Quad to the tribe, uh, th that's more meaningful from the standpoint of the United States. And, and same with Japan, I would argue that so long it's economic, uh, I don't think Japan or India would have any problems with any uh, cooperation, but the moment it gets into uh, kind of a security alliance, then it becomes a problem. Now, uh, the Ukraine probably, I'm sure BSS probably will host another conference on Ukraine separately because it's a, it's a totally different, uh, you know, uh, way of looking at things because there are so many perspectives to Ukraine. Uh, but just to put in, in, in one line, um, I believe uh, uh, the solution lies in making uh, uh, Ukraine a, a neutral uh, uh, zone, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I was telling uh, in, in, in some of the talk shows uh, that uh, best would be Ukraine to get into our foreign policy principle uh, and to apply that friendship towards all, malice towards none, probably uh, then uh, Ukraine uh, would be able uh, to focus more on the economic uh, development and not get, get into this NATO membership and others because in the long run, it, re it really doesn't help. It only helps uh, the military industrial complex. Thank you. Uh, Professor Takahara, would you like to uh, comment on this question? So can I say uh, a few? Can I say a few uh, words? Please go ahead. Can I, can I say? Yes, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll for the future of quad quadrilateral security dialogue, especially you know the India's you know position in uh, quad. In my, you know, of course, you know, India now is uh, facing quite difficult situation, how to balance the relation with United States on the, on the one hand, and, you know, the long time, you know, friendship with Russia. But given the current, you know, the deepened relation between Russia and China and on the one hand, and also Russia's relation with Pakistan have been, you know, gradually, being enhanced. I think, you know, in the coming years, India's commitment to uh, Quad will be further enhanced. So I think there may, may be some tension between US and, China, US and India, especially there's some, uh, you know, deep uh, concern on the part of US Congress about, the, you know, India's position on this, you know, U Ukraine uh, crisis. But you know, overall, you know, United States are quite uh, willing to further cooperate with India, and also India also now need further, you know, enhanced relation with other Quad members. So Quad getting more and more enhanced, you know, regional institutions in the coming years. Yeah. So never become a triad. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gekuchi. Uh, we now have just time for the last question. And um, uh, I have uh, Zubaida Farooq, um, student of peace and conflict studies from the University of Dhaka. Uh, if you would like to ask your question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Zubaida Hona Farooq. I'm pursuing my master's degree from Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at University of Dhaka. Since there is time constraint, I will keep my question and my remark very short. Uh, first of all, it's an honor for me to be a young graduate to get the opportunity to speak on this platform in front of so many mm -hmm. uh, respected personnel. Uh, my first question is to Im Professor Imtia Jahamis, sir. 
as sir has mentioned that Bangladesh has been maintaining a policy of development without enmity and very pragmatically Bangladesh has been very neutral in many regional issues so far. But in the last few months, there has been a little changes. For example, in the last month, uh, last uh, year, a few months back, there was an issue of Bangladesh joining Quad and there was some anomaly with uh, Chinese ambassador and other uh, stakeholder. And in the recent time, there has been short dial. And uh, at that time, uh, to be to quote after our honorable foreign minister, we make our own policy. And recently, there has been a uh, short dialogue between our honorable uh, foreign minister and the minister, foreign minister of India. Uh, so how do you analyze this transition of the country from being a very neutral on any issue to a country which stands for its own ground for the betterment or for the risk? And my second question is uh, to Professor Kikuchi that, um, there had in the background of the recent contemporary Ukraine Russia crisis, there has been aggravating comprehension apprehension that uh, the situation between China and Taiwan might the Taiwan might get worse. As he has mentioned that he asked for the involvement of both USA and China in the Indo-Pacific with the worsening situation if it happens. And since Japan has a major stake in this situation, how does he comprehend the whole outcome from that conflict? Thank you. Uh, Professor Kikuchi, would you like to go first? Yeah, I think, you know, Professor Takahara, you know, expert on the, you know, Japan-China relations. So I, I, would, I would ask uh, uh, Takahara-sensei to speak first. Yeah. Okay, Professor Takahara, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, any hostilities around Taiwan is a nightmare uh, for mm. everybody, everybody. It's going to be disastrous. Uh, mm. to, you know, just it just not this. It it's something that not only destroys the peace and the stability in the region uh, militarily, but also economic impact of that is going to be huge. Mm. Just imagine how many foreigners, including the Japanese, are living in Taiwan. Not only in Taiwan, but in Shanghai. And if that's going to be a war zone, what's mm. going to happen to us all? Uh, this is something that we should all think, think about. And um, therefore, the prevention of any hostilities uh, ac across the Taiwan Strait is the most important um, task that we have in front of us. Uh, so, you know, we, we should do everything because that's going to have an impact on the Bangladeshi e economy as well. I'm quite certain about that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, as, but some people talk about the linkage between Ukraine and Taiwan, but I don't mm. see a direct li linkage because mm. uh, the importance of Taiwan to the US is so, imp you know, different yeah. uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the level of concern. Mm. Uh, mm. So um, there should not be any misunderstanding that yeah. um, uh, if the US does not intervene militarily in the Ukraine, uh, the same thing is going to happen over Taiwan. That's that's not the, these two are not the same things. Yeah. Well, uh, Bangladesh was never approached to join Quad. I think there was a little bit of a misunderstanding, and uh, you know, if you're in the media, uh, and there are a good number of journalists out there, they love to ask a pointed question targeted question. So the question that was asked to the Chinese uh, ambassador was really targeted one. And I guess uh, sometimes language can also make a difference of how you respond uh, to that particular question. But as you know, uh, that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs called uh, uh, the, uh, the ambassador and uh, you know uh, made him say, uh, and then he tried to clarify that, that that was not the point. So we we will not be part of any military alliance or any alliance which will have some military sense. That's that has historically been our case. Just to give an example, uh, even during the Afghan Afghanistan war, mm -hmm. and this regime was in power. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the honourable member of parliament can help me on this more. Um, we were invited actually. Uh, we were asked to uh, send troops to Afghanistan. And uh, there was a lot of, you know, if you want to call pressure and all, but we said, no, we said, it's, you know, it's, no, it's not our job. Same thing happened earlier with the Kuwait war. We said, no, uh, we have always resisted to be part of the military. That's always been historical, civilizational, I would argue more. So no question of you, but any economic, um, 
you know, criteria which has economic benefits, um, I think Bangladesh should be very eager to go. And that should be where I think 21st century ought to go. And this is what globalization, you have a situation of win-win situation. You know, earlier we never had a win-win situation. With the colonialism, you can never have win-win situation. Only mm -hmm. one grows and other gets underdeveloped. With globalization, if you are clever, it's smart enough, you can actually go for a win-win situation. You can equally develop. And this is how uh, you, you can see China and some other countries, South Korea, in Singapore, some of the Asian countries really, you know, they made a huge uh, benefit from this globalization. So I think that's where we should focus and Ukraine also ought to focus on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for um, listening to a very interesting conversation. Now the onus lies with me. Um, I'm the person standing between you and lunch, so I can understand. Uh, mm -hmm. In the next few words, I'll say uh, that is definitely going to be important because after that, the lunch break uh, goes on. So I'll be brief. A mm -hmm. um, couple of points before we round up the session. Uh, Ambassador Fais pointed out, uh, he talked about geopolitics and he raised a very important issue. He said that whether geopolitics should be, is always about the impact of uh, politics on geography. There's a very interesting book by uh, a French uh, writer, Dominique Mosse, who talks about uh, the geopolitics of emotions, ladies and gentlemen, and, his, and he talks about hope, the geopolitics of hope, the geopolitics of fear, and the geopolitics of humiliation. And he asks us that we need to rethink the whole concept of geopolitics along these three lines. So when you talk about Bangladesh, I think uh, a lot of the discussion which, which came out here today, a lot of them centered around the geopolitics of hope, the hope and the confidence about this country and the hope that uh, in the days ahead, it will be able to flourish, it will be able to continue with its development trajectory. And of course, um, hopefully bad things will not happen. But the fear is also there, ladies and gentlemen, the fear, the geopolitics of fear that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and of course, humiliation also. I mean, when you look at uh, Ukraine right now, uh, the geopolitics of humiliation plays out, I think, in a, in a quite interesting manner. Uh, and fear is always there, the fear of enmity, the fear of competition, uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. And I think this is a very interesting way of, of looking at geopolitics coming out of the traditional geopolitics uh, in which I think we are often uh, welded into. So we need to come out of that. Number one point. Number two point is uh, the issue of 1905 partition came up today. Uh, very interesting. Uh, the ulterior political motive was always there, as Professor Imtiaz pointed out. But I would also like the audience to think at the economic rationals which were put forward by the then British administrators. They envisioned uh, Eastern Bengal connected with Assam and, of course, uh, connected with me then Burma, today's Myanmar, and going all the way up to um, the Chinese region, Kunming, and, and that particular area, which, to great extent, which is landlocked, if, if I can use that term. So the economic rationale of 1905 partition, this is something which is very, very important. So when we today we talk about connectivity, we talked about uh, economic uh, programs. And of course, uh, the Honorable Japanese uh, Ambassador has pointed out today the big projects which are taking place in Chittagong. The British administrators of that that time exactly talked about in a similar fashion. They looked at Chittagong port, they looked at the coal mines and the oil fields of Assam, and they looked at China and Myanmar, railway connections, road and river and communication system. I think this is a point which we often, uh, uh, that has been neglected whenever we talk about the 1905 partition, and, and this needs to be taken into consideration. The third point is, and um, uh, this has been raised by the last speaker, uh, what are the implications of the U Ukraine crisis for security, for geopolitics and global politics, the politics of alliances. I think this is something which in the days ahead, um, we need to think a lot about this. This is going to uh, crop up um, a couple of few interesting questions and, and, and this will uh, definitely have implications for us. One implication is that, is the shift again going to take place to Europe? Are we again going to see the Cold War politics coming into play, the Fulda gap, um, the heartland of, of Europe, uh, the tank formations and all that, you know, the Cold War jargon. Is that going to make a comeback? And if that makes a comeback, whether uh, in the discourse, uh, Indo-Pacific, um, this entire region, this is again going to take a backseat. So this is something which I think we need to take into consideration. Uh, the fourth point, and my last point is, 
uh, please remember, ladies and gentlemen, during uh, when the British ruled this part of the world, uh, the Royal Navy ensured that the Indian Ocean had turned into Britain's lake, like the Romans had done to the to the Mediterranean Sea. But one thing we must remember is that the British had domination over this region, but they did not have hegemony. I, I, I talk about ground scene in a way. This domination continued, but at the same time, please remember the movement of people, the movement of goods, the movement of pilgrims and ideas, this continued unhindered throughout this region. So what is the point I'm trying to make? I'm trying to make the point that geopolitics will always be there. Um, there will be national interests, there will be vested interests, there will be interests when they confront each other. But at the same time, we need to remember that people continue to move, ideas, trade, they continue to flourish in spite of these impediments. Uh, yes, if the impediments are not there, of course, the tempo, the intensity will increase. But in spite of these, uh, these things have taken place. So if you read Shugata Bosch's fascinating book, A Hundred Horizons, you will understand uh, the importance of literals and uh, how they were connected um, uh, during the colonial period. And of course, if again, if you look at Shunil Amrit's Riding the Waves, which talks about how uh, Indians, particularly, when I say Indians, I mean pre-1947, so people from Chittagong, uh, people from South uh, India, for example, going, turning Myanmar into a, a rice basket. These are the things which we need also to take into consideration whenever we talk about uh, the the economic potentials of this particular region. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Professor um, uh, Takahara um, uh, talked about stars, and I would like to take it from there, and, and, and I hope we'll finish on that note. Oscar Wilde reminded us that while many of us are in the gutter, some of us are looking at the stars. So this is this point is very important. So the, when you say that constellation is a construction, but the stars are there and we need to look at the stars, I like to echo him and, and, and say that, yes, maybe we are in the gutters, in fact, most of us all over the world, we are in the gutters, but some of us are looking at the stars and trying to change. And I think this is a, a positive note, which we should take uh, from this particular uh, seminar. So with this, I would like to give my thanks um, uh, to our um, honorable guests, particularly uh, to <clears throat> Uh, 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 Honorable uh, Mohammad Farooq Khan, MP, um, uh, Chairman, Parliamentary Standing Committee, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Bangladesh Parliament, uh, who has been through us throughout the session. I would also like to thank the, His Excellency uh, Ito Naoki, um, Japan's Ambassador to Bangladesh, for uh, for pointing out uh, Bangladesh-Japan uh, relations. I would like to thank uh, particularly the Japanese professors who made it a point to stay with us uh, throughout this entire session. Bengalis by nature are locations. I am no exception, ladies and gentlemen. So when we talk, unlike the Japanese, we often cannot stay within time. But that is fine. That is what the academic discourse is all about. But they have stayed with us and I would like to thank them. I would like to thank the entire audience for bearing with us, the people who have, uh, the, uh, this, the distinguished participants who have asked questions. And I would also like to thank the panelists. But last of all, I would like to particularly like to thank base for organizing this. I know how difficult a hybrid uh, program is, and we have been experiencing that throughout the session. But in spite of this, uh, they have done a commendable job. And I would like to thank uh, the base authorities, mm -hmm. through the chairman, uh, through the DG, and of course, all those who have worked behind the scene to make it a success. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now request all of you to kindly join us for lunch? Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.